Welcome to the podcast. It's dedicated to making you a faster cyclist. The Ask a Cycling Coach podcast presented by Trainer Road. I'm Coach Jonathan Lee with our head coach, Chad Timmerman. Hi, everybody. Our CEO, Nate Pearson. Low energy t- Chad Timmerman. <laughs> I'm tired. I'm still, yeah. Just, just I'm smooth Chad Timmerman yeah. today. Hello, everyone. And smooth. I apologize for the voice here, just getting over a cold. And for listeners, I guess I should say frequent or dedicated listeners to the podcast, you know that my voice goes away even after I sneeze. Without being sick, my voice goes away for about 20 minutes. So, so delicate. I'm just a delicate flower, so bear with me with this voice here. I'll, I'll try to speak less. Uh, but before we get into uh, anything too deeply here, just wanted to thank everybody for sending in awesome <laughs> questions. Uh, poured through all of them that you sent, and you can do that at trainerroad.com slash podcast. Uh, we got some really cool questions, some really fun ones and unique ones. And we really appreciate that, and we appreciate you listening. You can join us live every Thursday at 8 a.m. Pacific on YouTube. It's just trainer road, or youtube.com slash trainer road. You can find it there. And you can join us live, too, so then you can see us as well. But more importantly, you can interact with other people that are listening live. A lot of coaching questions get answered while we're talking by other people that are listening, which is a lot of fun. That's the way the forum works. Yep. And you can go to forum.trainerroad.com and you can also stay tuned at the end of this episode here and we'll answer some of those live questions that you've submitted while watching live. So exciting stuff. Uh, first things first, before we go into the questions, we do have a couple job postings we want to mention. Yep. We're still hiring uh, React and React Native engineers. Apply for those at trainer.com slash jobs. Mm-hmm. Um, and then uh, customer support team, but that's local only. So if you live in Reno or Sparks and want to come drive in the office, uh, that's also at trainer.com slash jobs. Yep. Exciting stuff. We're growing constantly. So uh, getting into Matt's question right off the bat, he says, I've been a trainer road user since the beta days and really loving the continuous improvements. Plus the podcast is a 10 and makes my commute disappear. I have a chronic disease, which is controllable with medicine, but one of the side effects of the medicine is anemia. The only medical solution I've had, and he says, or he says the only medical solution he mentions, I've had the full iron panel to rule out low iron or ferritin is to take EPO. Seriously, that's all I've gotten. Whoa, dude. <laughs> yeah. And he says, I've had the discussion with my hematologist. So any research or thoughts on how I should change my training or recovery, given that I have anemia? <clears throat> first things first, it's kind of crazy to hear a, a legitimate justification for the use of EPO. Hey, what, can you get a TUE for EPO? <clears throat> I'm pretty sure no. Yeah, I would think not. But you can group ride as much as you want. Yeah, and exactly. destroy everybody. It's, <laughs> it's, I mean, it's got to be like one of the most famous performance enhancing drugs there is for, especially for our sport, yeah, right? For sure. Yeah. Um, so it's just weird to me to hear like a justified usage of it. I never hear of EPO being utilized, you know, exogenous so EPO like Usually that. like cancer patients and stuff. Right, yeah. exactly. People who aren't training. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, any research or thoughts on how I should change my training or recovery given that I have anemia? So uh, I'm guessing, Matt, are you, is uh, Matt going to have low hematocrit then? I With would that, assume. You're yeah, way, he, way, way ahead of me. Okay. I got, I got so much on this matter. You okay. Got, you don't cool. know. I got a big cup of coffee. <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> You're going to get Nate's through that whole thing. All right, Chad. Uh, okay, sadly, Matt, I, I don't have much for you. Um, sorry to say. <laughs> That's it. That's no, I'm just it. kidding. Um, at least not, not specific to training and recovery methods, though I did try real hard. Um, I might as well dash your hopes right away. I don't want <laughs> to string you along. But this question did get me much, much further down the path of looking into iron, fi- iron deficiency anemia and iron deficiency anemia. And even though I can't give you direct advice, I wanted to do my best to offer insight into all, the di- all of these disorders in the hopes that maybe I can perhaps open your eyes to something you haven't considered and in the process educate you all. Cool. So what I hope to do here is fourfold. Uh, first... I want to familiarize everyone with the symptoms and effects of both anemia, iron deficiency, basically describe the afflictions, and then two, explain how endurance athletes are susceptible to both and how they affect our bodies and our performance. Um, Three, give suggestions on how to accurately differentiate or diagnose any or all three, and then finally describe how we can prevent or address these disorders. All right. Okay. We're buckling up. Buckle up. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Where do you want to start then? Okay. So regarding anemia, um, there's an amazing number of, of the types of anemia, but I'm pretty sure they all share a few simple characteristics. A drop in the number or size of your red blood cells in your blood, a drop in the hemoglobin content of your blood, and really just a decline in your body's ability to transport oxygen. That's kind of the buzz term right there. Got it. And then iron deficiency can play a part in all those things, and I'll try to explain all the overlaps in wondrous detail as we go. (laughs) So the hemoglobin I just mentioned is the protein in our blood, and it's responsible for transporting oxygen. It contains heme, which is an iron-containing compound in hemoglobin, and it's the iron within heme that binds to oxygen. Got it. So hemoglobin contains heme, 
Heme contains iron, iron binds to oxygen. So iron's absorbed via the small intestine like so many nutrients and micronutrients from the food we ingest. We don't, we don't get it endogenously. Um, it can even be stored there temporarily, but it's mostly stored in your liver and of course your red blood cells. Because, and this is especially relevant to endurance athletes, it's iron that binds oxygen in order to distribute it to our brains, to our organs, and obviously our working muscles. Kind of needs it like a companion there, hand in hand. You got it, buddies. Also, um, when red blood cells age and eventually die because what their, their uh, turnaround is like 120 days, that's supposedly their average lifespan, they're then effectively recycled in the spleen. And after the hemoglobin has been stripped off and its heme molecule is then metabolized back into bilirubin is excreted anyway, it's, it's this whole, a whole ball of goings on that I don't really need to cover for our purposes. Right. Point is the remaining iron in those recycled red blood cells is then stored in the spleen. So iron deficiency is really a matter of low iron levels in your liver, in your spleen, and in your red blood cells, and also your bone marrow, because that's where iron's used to form new red blood cells. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, follow? Mm-hmm. I'm with okay. you. I'm tracking. So now when, <laughs> when iron deficiency leads to anemia, it means a couple of things. First, we can't get enough oxygen to our working muscles and, and the rest of the body for that matter. Um, we can't generate as much ATP within the working muscles, specifically our aerobic fibers, due to, the, due to this lack of adequate iron. It's related to the Krebs cycle, electron transport, cytochrome C, all that's too granular for what I want to cover today. Um, and by the way, I, w I went way, way, way down the rabbit hole on this one. So <laughs> if I start to get off track talking about details that maybe aren't that relevant to endurance athletes, feel free to get me back on I'll track. I'll pull you back. Yeah. So all I'm trying to illustrate here is that iron is fundamentally necessary in getting oxygen from our lungs to our working muscles. And if we're short on iron within the body, basically we're not absorbing enough via our diets and iron hmm. deficiency will start and wreak its various forms of havoc on our bodies and of course our performance. Hmm. Okay, so what are these forms of havoc you ask? So we as endurance athletes can be afflicted with certain iron challenging issues that non-athletes are probably never gonna have to concern themselves with. Um, we have heavy training loads, and while yes, high intensity training is certainly a culprit, any number of things leads to exercise induced hemolysis, which is the rupturing of red blood cells. Um, so, much of what the f uh, what's to follow right here is called from a 2015 study in the British Journal of General Practice, um, and, and it's just the various uh, issues that affect us as endurance athletes. First off, high intensity intervals are frequently to blame for this red blood cell rupture uh, breakdown mm -hmm. that I just described. Impact. Mm -hmm. So just the act of running where you encounter something called heel strike hemolysis is uh, basically the act of landing uh, during your stride actually breaks down red blood cells. I think that it just happens in running period and we yeah, should avoid does. running at all times. Well, that actually happened to me. My hematocrit <laughs> went down to like 37. Uh, really? Um, when I started running triathlon, yeah. I used to get my blood tested. Fascinating. At, at work, they would do it once a month and you could get like a CBC and cholesterol. Yeah. And I was just like, I'll just do it. And then I started triathlon and just bam, 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 ticked down. But then it, it ticked back up after a while too. But so crazy, science, right? They just uh, explode. Science is, yeah. Telling, yeah. science is telling us that we should just not run. Don't run. Yeah. That's the There's a lot of reasons yeah. not to run. But caveman did it, so we have to. <laughs> yeah, there we go. <laughs> That's science right we there. We lived to 30, dude. <laughs> <laughs> we could go down that vein for a long time. Sorry, Chad. No, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> totally fine. Dress it up. Um, oxidative stress. And we're all really familiar with the battle between our antioxidant system and its ability to combat the oxidative stress that we face pretty routinely. Um, blood loss in both our GI tracts and our urinary tracts. Yeah. Um, this is due to tiny lesions that result from reduced blood flow during exercise to our organs. Yeah. Who, who knew? Um, iron that's actually used as part of the inflammatory process. And I've seen mention of iron loss due to excessive sweating, but the science on that is pretty weak. Looks like the iron's probably coming from somewhere else. So <laughs> if you see that, I don't know that it holds water. That would have been you in Hawaii, Nate. Yes. The amount of oh, sweat yeah. that been was pouring off of Nate was, was that not, I've never seen anything like that I've in my never, life. Never, never. Me either. Ever. I was sweating a lot. I've, I've, my entire body had a, had a sheen stream. on it the entire time. A, and yes. a stream. stream from my legs. <clears throat> yeah. It was like no one cares, stuff but coming off the knees. <laughs> <It> was, <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Yeah. I didn't know that it was possible. We should have so. filmed it. Yeah. <laughs> we should have. Yeah. Um, so that's probably enough of a list to describe the iron related challenges we face as athletes, but there is an added bummer. In that when a training stressor causes little more than inflammation, super common, that inflammation causes an inflammatory response. That response includes the release of cytokines, which in turn cause the release of a protein called hepcidin. Mm. 
Now, hepcidin is of particular relevance to us as athletes, all athletes really, endurance or strength, um, when we're talking about iron absorption, because not only does it decrease the iron absorption in your gut, but it also traps <coughs> iron in the various types of cells in which it's stored or sequestered in the case of macrophages in the immune response where they gobble it up as a defense mechanism because iron is potentially toxic. Hmm. So for a few hours after a workout or a race, this release of hepcidin can restrict our availability of iron. It's still there, we just can't get at it. I'm meaning anything you ingest during that window of time goes unused. Hmm. So basically you might as well just toss any supplements in the toilet because that's where they're going anyway. They're just gonna get past. Hmm. So some other causes of either anemia, iron deficiency, um, specific to athletes, but also general to people, blood loss, Pretty straightforward. Probably not going to be at the top of your game if you were just in an accident that involves heavy, ble heavy bleeding. Hmm. Don't need me to tell you that. Donating? Yeah. <laughs> well, that's yeah. more realistically blood loss through blood donation. Um, in women, menstruation and pregnancy too, which mm -hmm. is a whole additional iron-related topic that I was going to get into. But man, this this just ballooned, so I had to had to limit it. Um, but this is a good time to mention that IUDs have <laughs> demonstrated. Uh, the potential. So there's a possibility to increase blood loss during menstruation, while oral contraceptives, on the other hand, and I suspect this isn't true in all cases, lessen this blood loss. So mm -hmm. in any case, there is a birth control consideration here, something women might consider bringing up to their OBGYNs. Mm -hmm. And then some other potential causes of low iron stores, destruction of red blood cells. Think back to the types of hemolysis I just talked about. Um, and I'm going to list a lot more dietary considerations later, but low intake of vitamin B12, can affect absorption, so eat more dirt. <laughs> Celiac disease and Crohn's disease are at least two diseases that I know affect, or that I learned affect absorption. And then insufficient stomach acid. So heartburn medications, PPIs, Prilosec specifically, um, can all negatively impact your ability to uh, absorb iron. Everything affects and then everything. Even changes in blood plasma. So, so like we might get through just endurance training, but also through sauna training or any form of heat acclimation training. Hmm. Um, and then that, that's due to the adaptations that take place present as anemia because, uh, uh due to the athlete's blood delusion, di I'm sorry, dilution, which is just an increase in our plasma, right? The liquid portion of our blood, which yeah. ostensibly appears as anemia because it gives a false impression that our red blood cell count or our hematocrit has fallen mm -hmm. since the ratio of plasma to RBCs has changed seemingly unfavorably, though it's not actually the case, right? I mean, we still have the, the same number and size of red blood cells, probably the same iron content as well. Mm -hmm. uh, but there is actually a term for that that I learned. It's called dilutional pseudoanemia. Oh, that's, Pseudo that's, being the key word there. It's good to know. <laughs> okay, so how about the symptoms? Um, like what we should look for when we want to determine whether or not our performance and health are being impacted by a lack of iron or our so, ability to move oxygen. I know what you're going to say right now. And I'm, I'm sorry, everyone hates when we interrupt, but <laughs> no, no, this please. is dry subject. Seriously, this is going to go on a long, I mean, it, it's oh, yeah. better if we can oh. interject, no, chat, no, not chat. that long. It's better if we can <laughs> interject some, uh, yeah, some chat banter. actually what? prefers that we interject. I know. So yeah. we, we should cover Please say that you say that chat because everyone gets mad at us. I totally do. Otherwise I just feel like I'm talking he, in a microphone. He literally says, Nate and Jonathan, please interrupt me. Yeah. Okay. If it's yeah. relevant. If it's relevant. <laughs> or not. <laughs> just, just energy. But okay, so you're going to talk about some <clears throat> symptoms. Yep. And I know what symptoms you're going to say. And everyone's going to be like... Well, I'm anemic. I'm anemic. <laughs> right? Yeah. But I, I think you're going to mention also too, like oh, you already have, too much iron can be toxic and it can lead to prostate cancer in men. So you can't, you don't want to like just start bang in the iron supplements. So if you uh, stop listening, absolutely not. Yeah. Yes, so if exactly. you stop listening partway through this, when Chad's talking about symptoms, don't just don't go, just go crazy. I, I know, but I'm just, it's like the yeah. low T, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. I, I get tired sometimes. <laughs> yeah. I have low T. <laughs> yeah. Like well, I give, I have foggy I'm brain. I try to be pretty specific about the symptoms. I'm also going to be very specific about involving a physician in any sort of supplementation oh. you decide to undertake, especially iron. Oh yeah. 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 Cause For you, sure. and two, you can get tested. Like it's easy. Oh yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. You just go to your doctor. Be like, I'm an endurance athlete. Uh, yeah. I think I might have low iron. They'll be like, but it's fraught with certain challenges because we're endurance athletes and we, we don't abuse our bodies, but we challenge our bodies in certain ways. Oh, we abuse them. Yeah. yeah just like, <laughs> just like what you were saying there with I mean, whether it's running or whether it's you know, the, the heat training, anything else, it can yep. skew the results a bit. Yep. And yeah. Yeah. Okay. So <clears throat> let's talk symptoms. Most relatably, you just think of how you feel when you can't get enough oxygen, right? You're short of breath, lightheaded, um, lethargic, heavy legs, sometimes to the point where you feel like you can't even get out of bed in the morning. Um, sometimes heart palpitations where you're incredibly aware of your heartbeat, um, complexion gets pale, 
And then maybe less commonly, headache, tinnitus, which, you know, noises outside of the body rather than from, from uh, or I'm sorry, noises inside the body rather from an out, than from an outside source. Mm. All their sense of taste, feeling itchy, sore tongue, hair loss, pica, which is a fascinating and awful compulsion, I don't know if you've heard of it, where people can't control their urge to eat non-food items. Typically, it's ice. Mm. Yeah. Whoa. So, but they eat ice to the point where their tongue looks like sandpaper and even to the point where their teeth start to break. So, so it's a real compulsion. It's it's it sounds awful, really. That's crazy. <laughs> yeah. So Yikes. difficulty swallowing, open sores or ulcers on the corners of your mouth, spoon-shaped fingernails and toenails, and then horizontal striations in your nails rather than the typical vertical ones. Huh. Yeah. Ver- vertical being following in line with your finger. Exactly. And horizontal being opposing that. As I understand it. Okay. Yep. Interesting. And then finally, uh, restless leg syndrome. So one very reputable expert said if you exhibit restless leg syndrome, there's a 75% 75% chance you're iron deficient. And if you're iron deficient, there's a 30 to 40% chance you'll suffer from restless leg syndrome, which is huh. interesting as I sit huh. here bouncing my leg around. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Okay. So now you think you might be dealing with an iron or anemia related issue and you're heading to a physician. So first off, I, I don't know how well versed a general practitioner is in something as specific as iron deficiency anemia. Maybe perfectly, since it's such a common ailment, but if I had my druthers, I'd probably try to make my way to a specialist, and maybe a doctor of internal medicine, maybe a hematologist. I don't know if this is the realm of a sports physician, but um, a specialist definitely appeals to me. My GPs have been pretty on the ball. Pretty on it? Oh, yeah, for okay. sure. I, I think it's super common. It's hugely common. Yeah. Apparently, it's the most common Very. form of anemia. Yeah. So. Yep. Okay, so anyway... Yeah. I was just going to say, especially for, for women. So it's, it's, women it's particularly common. S- especially susceptible, yes. Right. So you've chosen a doctor. There are a, f- are a few things that I'd like you to be aware of, and this is where my research went a bit off the rails. First off, ferritin, which is typically measured because uh, it serves as a marker for body iron stores, but it can increase as a result of inflammation. And as endurance athletes, and, and especially those who engage in high-intensity interval training and running with that heel strike hemolysis, et cetera, we get inflammation. That inflammation can I- uh, elevate those ferritin levels and potentially mask an iron deficiency. Hmm. So high ferritin, but we actually do have deficient iron stores. <clears throat> hemoglobin. Obviously, a measure of hemoglobin is going to be part of an examination where low hemoglobin might be a concern. <laughs> But studies have revealed that you can have low tissue iron without a corresponding low blood value. So hmm. you could, it's basically iron deficiency without anemia, which makes my head hurt. <laughs> um, and then, so, so basically what that's saying is that low tissue iron status is more what matters. And that's the very thing that impairs our endurance performance and our endurance adaptations. Hmm. So simply looking at serum levels or your blood levels of hemoglobin may not tell the whole story. Hmm. And then... Another potential for a, a clouded diagnosis, let's say, should you choose to see a physician, and you know by now I think we've made it clear that you absolutely should if iron supplementation is on your radar. Mm-hmm. But another iron deficiency red herring comes in the form of something that's now termed iron-restricted erythropoiesis. I won't burden you with the many other names it used to have. But this is where your iron stores are actually sufficient. You're not, you're not iron deficient, but the iron isn't available in one way or another for the process of generating new red blood cells. Got something it. that takes place in your bone marrow, and as you may have guessed, it's called erythropoiesis. So iron-restricted erythropoiesis. Um, and then many of you probably recall, and we just talked about the EPO, or erythropoietin, is uh, something that was used prolifically in the, in the heyday of the doping era. It's actually naturally produced by the kidneys, and it's what's responsible for signaling the production of new red blood cells. Mm. So in the case of iron-restricted erythropoiesis, e- even though the iron's there, your stores are measurably sufficient, your ability to make new red blood cells is diminished. Mm. And this is obviously has an impact on our endurance performance mm. and, and our health. Mm-hmm. So in this case, you could, you could actually see a physician demonstrate adequate or even high levels of some of the markers of iron, ferritin, for example, or ferritin in this case, and still have anemia, just not iron deficiency anemia. Clear, clear as mud. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just about. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so... so it seems, it seems it, like uh, if you're an endurance athlete, then it'd be really tough to get an accurate fix. It gets a little tricky, but blood there are particular markers and a particular test 
that I'm going to talk about it's perfect. shortly. Yeah. Dive in, Chad. So, and, and this is actually a good time to thank doctors David Steensma, Erica Goldstein, and Michael Arbuck, who are collectively responsible for me knowing way too much about these topics now. <laughs> but it's cool. It was, it was it was interesting. It was just hard to trim down all the all the information. But r- back briefly to the iron restricted erythropoiesis. Um, this is resoundingly the best time to consider an IV an IV iron infusion. Hmm. Um, it's another topic that I'm far too well versed on now, but <clears throat> the, the fact is that oral ingestion of iron supplements is very seldom well tolerated by most people. Huh. Something I didn't know. I've never interesting. Uh, they, they attribute it to so, GI perturbations. So that would be like if you take like an iron pill. So what I'm guessing, yeah. So if you go to the doctor, they say you're low in iron. They prescribe oral iron. A lot of people don't tolerate it well, and by a lot, I mean seventy percent. Interesting so it is the figure, and I don't know if that's people afflicted with. Um, some form of anemia or, or iron deficiency, or if that's just people in general. Huh. Interesting. So, and I'll, I'll talk a little more about iron, uh, IV, iron infusion, when I when I close out this discussion. Cool. In just a few minutes here, promise. <laughs> so, really, we're concerned with getting a thorough blood test. Um, and after all my research, I actually have a few things that I, that I I do want to recommend. Um, uh, yep, and here goes the list. Might want to jot these down. There's a few of them, and some of them are, are pretty wordy. But ferritin, obviously, mm-hmm. um, MBC, which is your mean corpuscular value, and it's just a measure of the volume of your red blood cells, and that's going to be included on on a standard blood panel. I think a lot of this will be, and what isn't is probably going to be included if you tell your doctor, your physician, that you think you might be anemic, you think you might be iron deficient. Got it. Um, hemoglobin and hematocrit, of course. And then something called your transference saturation, which is your blood iron level divided by your TIBC, which is your total iron binding capacity. It's, it's how well your blood can carry iron. Okay. But transference saturation is a big deal. And then finally, what sounds like uh, kind of a new test is something that looks at your soluble transferrin receptor levels. Hmm. Um, because they're apparently not sensitive. These receptors aren't sensitive to inflammation. And this test makes it easy to see something that you might not otherwise detect. Hmm in the face of markers that say you are, in fact, uh, your, your iron stores are adequate. And this one sounds particularly relevant to endurance athletes. Interesting. So if you have one of these markers and they're showing that, that you need more iron, that sort of a thing, and you don't want to take the <clears throat> risk of probably not tolerating it well with just like taking an iron supplements, yep. what would be the dietary recommendations? Well, yeah, I'll get to the dietary ones. They are, <clears throat> they are many and really they're actually about Actually, I'm just about to get to that. Okay, so, cool. Yeah, nope. Sorry, sorry, Chad. Sorry. Um, in fact, I'm trying to move it a <clears throat> No, nope, that's what I'm getting to right now. So let's see. So when it comes to dietary considerations, it's as much about what you eat and when you eat it and the combination of what you eat. So it gets it gets pretty tricky. Like all things. Yeah, right. right. Yeah. So first consider your natural sources of iron because there's a difference whether you're ingesting, whether you're ingesting heme iron or non-heme iron, basically mm-hmm. plant versus animal heme, heme being the, the animal one, because they'll affect your levels of absorption. Non-heme has to be changed before it can be absorbed, and heme doesn't. So absorption from one source of iron may not equate to what you'd absorb from another source. Mm-hmm. It's basically a matter of bioavailability. Hard word to say fast. And then on the topic of nutrition, number of absorption inhibiting nutrients. And this is, this is the stuff everyone doesn't want to hear, but there is a silver lining. So tannins in coffee, tea, and wine. Um, dairy, which uh, is due to both how it affects the mucosal lining of our intestines, and I'm pretty sure it binds calcium. It might be one in the same. Maybe that happens in the mucus lining. I'm not sure. Uh, pythate, or pitate, sorry, containing foods like bran, beans, grains, walnuts, almonds, and seeds. Eggs contain something called phosphovitin, which binds iron and can actually affect your entire meal's iron absorption. Hmm. Oxalate-containing foods like spinach, which actually contains iron. That's a head scratcher. (laughs) Kale, beets, chocolate, nuts, tea again, strawberries, oregano, basil, parsley, and then polyphenol-containing foods. So cocoa, coffee again, apples, blackberries, raspberries, blueberries, all combined iron. Wow. Bind to iron. Okay. And this checks a lot of my dietary boxes. So... The, the silver lining, though, is that this isn't caused to avoid these foods, simply to help you time them relative to your iron intake should your iron levels be a concern. Got it. And it really is just about separating your intentional iron intake from foods like these. By how far you separate them, I'm not entirely clear. I'm sure yeah. that's going to matter a lot on how much of these things you ingest. So what I've done this to, to boost it, you can take a supplement, and I've done that supplement, and you want a supplement with vitamin C because that will then help... Yep. Uh, 
the Sorry, absorption. I'm jumping ahead, but... No, no, no that's, yeah. that's fine. Cool. So that will help the absorption. We're only going to touch briefly um, on that. And you can do that between meals. So if you if you think you want to do it, you don't want to take this, like the pill during a meal, because just what Chad said, things can interfere with it. Hmm. The other thing you can do is you take some lamb and some orange juice, you blend it together, make a lamb orange juice smoothie. That'd be <laughs> sounds <laughs> interesting. Sounds delicious. But I mean, if you want to, if you really want to do it through food, you right, can take right. some like high iron stuff and some high vitamin C, <laughs> having the same meal away from other meals. Yep. It, but taking a little pill is lamb smoothie. Pretty good too. And, and the uptick in absorption. <laughs> Sorry, I'm kind of asleep, so. <laughs> no, that's right. Yeah, the lamb uptick smoothie. in absorption for with uh, with vitamin C is supposedly modest. So it's not oh, yeah. as much. It, it's not. It's not cure all. It's not going to. And it's for non true deficiency. The non heme iron too. So it's a little joke about yes, the about too. the iron. So it's more plant based iron. But if you are a a, a vegan, it's kind of hard too to get iron as like a vegan without getting vitamin C because probably the plants you're eating will already have one of the same. Exactly. Yeah. Sure. Like, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. So what are, <clears throat> excuse me, what are some iron absorbing recommendations, both dietary and otherwise? Mm -hmm. First off, eat enough. That it's really that simple. Energy, de energy yeah. deficiency leads to micronutrient deficiency. You can't get all your micronutrients if you're not giving yourself general generally enough enough food as logical as that seems that's something that us cyclists are very good at not doing absolutely so. and, and, and women especially <laughs> not me. Uh, female athletes <laughs> nate doesn't have that problem <laughs> female athletes and eating disorders i mean go hand in hand and we're finding yeah. male athletes and eating disorders go hand in hand as well it's just not as frequently discussed yeah yeah exactly um secondly probably don't drink tea or coffee with your meals save for before or after Boo. Uh, i know i know <laughs> i know <laughs> Opt for whole grain products over specifically brand products. Uh, cook with stainless steel or cast iron. Huh. Maybe eat red meat sometimes, shellfish too. And then include sources of, like Nate mentioned, vitamin C, B12, folate, zinc with your iron intake because each of them, each of them have been shown to increase absorption to varying degrees. Um, obviously, eat foods high in iron, but you know do consider their absorbability or bioavailability. And when you're sick, don't take iron. It simply won't absorb in the face of infection. So it's wasted. Interesting. Huh. Okay. So then when it comes to supplementation, and again, you're doing this because you've undergone blood tests and you're working with a qualified physician. Who understands that you're an endurance athlete. Yes. Yep. Ideally. Absolutely. Um, because unused iron stores or unused iron does in fact get stored and this can lead to organ damage Too high dosages of supplemental iron can elicit the hepcidin response I talked about, and that can block further iron absorption for the next, uh, geez, 48 to 72 hours. So two to three days hmm. of absorption, uh, hampering, but oh. regarding supplementation, science is telling us that smaller doses are usually the way to go. It, it usually tends to be somewhere along the 40 to 80 milligrams of elemental iron, and the type of iron is absolutely important. Um, and this assumes that you tolerate oral ingestion well. Again, like I said, about 70% people do not. Wow. And then there's also research on alternate day iron supplementation, um, sometimes even less frequent for those who want to go the oral supplementation route but have trouble tolerating it. So maybe they can just reduce their frequency. Um, and then also in the, the way it absorbs has to do with the frequency too. So if you're doing it too frequently, then you'll create problems that you could otherwise avoid by hmm. breaking it up. Uh, and then as far as finding the best quality of iron supplements, your physician is likely to make some recommendations, um, but if you want to do your own, own homework, and I always encourage people to do exactly that, you can check nsf.org or informedchoice.org for what many consider, myself included, to be trustworthy brand recommendations. Cool. Uh, a couple things that could like cause anemia. Uh, one, someone mentioned in the live chat, uh, internal bleeding. My dad had internal bleeding yeah, after ulcers, surgery. Bleeding. Uh, and internal bleeding. Scary. Yeah, yeah, and like you didn't you you don't know. And mm -hmm. someone else in the chat had that. Um, Patrick too says, and someone else said, like you might if you uh, if you're not getting like drops in performance, you're probably not to the state of what we're talking about. Yeah, but right. Patrick Baker says here, uh, his first symptoms before blood test was he couldn't hit his targets and it kept dropping, right? Mm -hmm. And um, so if that happens, like out of the blue, you start to drop and you can't do it and you're like, why is this happening? I would go to your doctor and, and discuss it and, sure. and figure that yeah. out. Um, mm -hmm. But in general, if you're just like a little bit sleepy sometimes, yeah. uh, you're probably fine, you have yeah. a balanced diet. But it's, it's the, uh, it, what you said though, Chad, it's, it's tough because maybe the test doesn't show everything, mm -hmm. um, but you could, it's so easy if you do have a, specific like your low iron it'll show up on a blood test um yeah. and you can just 
It's, or, it's interesting how much we've learned from this though. I was diagnosed with mono when I was in, when I was in high school mm -hmm. and part of that also, they were saying like, well, you know, one thing that we're going to want to do is supplement iron sure. uh, because of where you're at and then that'll help. And to be honest, I'm not sure if it ever did, but I remember specifically them saying, I was like, how much should I take? They're like, well, you're really iron deficient. So you just take whatever you want. Basically. It was like, you hmm. can't take too much, you know? Yeah, um, you and this, can. this was definitely not like any sort of specialist other than just simply getting a blood panel than working with a family practice doctor. Uh, but so like, I guess that's more of like a, a cautionary tale of this just how many years ago. Oh, this was in 2002. Uh, yeah. Oh, so, okay. so, so quite some time ago. ago. Um, so just a cautionary tale to make sure that you're dealing with people that understand that we're really lucky here to have like a, I know Nate's family practitioner and ours it's, he's an endurance athlete and he understands that whole thing. Let me, maybe you switch then. Um, but he, he understands the whole concept of an endurance athlete is mm -hmm. going to have, like require special cases. Yep. So it's, it's so important if you do think that you're in this scenario that you go through that. And also a, another thing, uh, many females that have spoken to endurance athletes, whenever they get tested, they're always told that they're iron deficient. Yeah. I can't and, remember the statistics, the percentage, but it's ridiculous. It's high. very high. Yeah. So, so once again, with that knowledge, uh, don't just, uh, I guess kind of do the whiplash reaction and just take whatever <sighs> comes. Um, but you know, take a measured approach. Should we jump it. to like the online testing? Cause it, that ties sure. right. In. Let's okay, do wait, it. Let, yeah. let me cover one more thing. Sure. Cause I'm done. Yeah. I mean, yeah, this ahead. is it. Cool. I, I just have one more point and it's on IV cool. iron infusion. Yeah, so th this treatment, if you are truly iron deficient, you've been diagnosed and you're considering, you know, uh, treatments do consider IV iron infusion because this technology or you know, tr treatment method has come a long, long way since the days when it was deemed both dangerous and ineffective. Hmm. Um, I, I, I could honestly talk on this a long, a long while. Please do. A couple of really good <laughs> podcasts on it. Suffice it to say, in the face of true iron deficiency, dietary changes and oral supplementation are likely to either fall short or take literal months to bring your iron stores back yeah, up to where you want time. them to be. It's not a quick process. Mm -hmm. When IV infusion can do the same work in literally 15 to 60 minutes. So that could be something to talk to your doctor about. Be like, it absolutely can I just is. Get a IV? Just, yeah, <laughs> maybe. And yeah. actually, why not? I don't know why you wouldn't at I think least if, bring it up. Only if you're. Uh, I look for a lot of stuff. If you're elite, like Keegan, I think cannot do needles. <laughs> he can't do it. Yeah, he but, can't do needles. but us normal people really? can. Just, yeah. yeah, we did. We do it, man. I feel like I, we talked about this a lot. I think on one of the podcast episodes that you basically have to be what they consider, and it's a subjective, basically decision that they make. But you have to be a nationally competitive athlete to have to abide oh, yeah. by a different set of rules. Yep. So that's and, what they told us, right? Cause yeah. I was asking like, why do, why do you care? Yeah. And they're they national level. Yeah. Yeah. They're like, Nate, you're not of concern. Right. <laughs> um, and basically like you have to get to that point. Now they said that you would know if you got there because they would notify yeah. you. But if you're so, going for like a national championship, a world championship, or you're a pro athlete, I would like, no, IVs, IVs. Uh, well, I would just research it and talk to like global drill, the water people and be like, Hey, yes. especially if you're a woman and you have low and, uh, yeah. iron, like just and be careful at the very least, make sure you ask because at the very yeah. least that's going to then help your case. If you did get into yeah, a situation, cause they record all that too. So if yep, you ask sure. and they tell you it's, I, I would assume that you would be okay then. Yes. Uh, I, would, I would have to believe that if an IV infusion is going to be allowed, this would be one of those situations, but you would think, yeah, who knows? Yeah, I can only guess. Huh? Okay. So, uh, I just, let me close with a fun example of if you decide I don't want to do an IV infusion, I'm just going to do it dietarily. Yeah. <clears throat> and I'll, I'll be honest. I pillaged this from a curbsiders podcast. Um, so rather than see a physician for a transfusion, which is commonly one gram administered over the course of, you know, 50 to 60 minutes. So our tops, keeping in mind that hundred grams of steak or, you know, roughly a quarter pound has less than two milligrams of iron. You'd have to eat somewhere in the ballpark of 140,000 calories of steak to match that IV infusions content of Whoa. iron. So dietary versus infusion incomparable. Wow. That's probably an entire cow. That would be very tough. It's, it's quite yeah. a lot. It's quite <laughs> a lot. Yeah. Uh, so let's actually transfer into, we just wanted to share a few things that we're doing right now, all of us that yeah. are kind of like helping in this regard. And one of the things that I've been doing for testing this specific thing is there's a company called Everly. Well, we don't work with them in, or anything. I just, um, it was actually, my wife was the one that was looking at getting some food allergy testing done. And it was really at the spurring of food sensitivity. Yes. That's, that's, uh, that's a key thing to, yeah. to the differentiator here. Can they not diagnose actual allergies via? Um, I mean, their tests test. do uh, allergies, but they're looking for IgG response for food sensitivity. So although it might not kill you, it might make you feel like have an immune response to it. Yeah. And that's what 
Everly is trying to do. So hmm. they're very careful about saying that. So yeah. I should probably very also careful. be careful about yeah. saying that. Um, okay. And I think it's just because who knows if it's because of liability, right, or something else. And, you know. know, they may not catch something, but that's just is what it is. Uh, so my wife was actually looking into this, and I saw it, and uh, I, so I did. They they have a bunch of different tests. I think Nate, you basically bought every test. Kit I think you I bought could. every test. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so there's a bunch of different tests you can take. Uh, really easy, like send at home kit blood panel testing. And they're all blood based <clears throat> tests. Or? Not urine, Not sure. blood, uh, so, and I think saliva. Yeah. Depending what it is. So I did one where it was it tested for 96 common foods, which honestly, 96 common foods, uh, it'd be great if any of us ate so, you know, uh, right. such a varied such diet a... that we lived outside of 96. And much more commonly, we live within. But uh, the 96 was, was effectively comprehensive for me. And it basically was just a kit and it, you pricked your finger with the little, these little lancets that they included. And then you just filled up a couple like uh, things dots. on a card, little dots yeah. on a card, mm -hmm. sent it off. And then for me, it was two days later, I have my results. It was really Whoa, good. Two you days? Me that. Two That's days. Crazy. They yeah. have uh, so uh, I, I wanted to jump to this because they have an iron test. Yes, yeah, they do. So if you, um, and it's not that expensive. So if you don't, sometimes mm -hmm. seeing your doctor takes forever. Mm -hmm. uh, so you could just do this online. They um, also, they get also, the results. yeah. So, um, they have like a men's health and a women's health one. And within that, they test that very thing. Yeah. Uh, so iron amongst other things that they also test within you there. You get testosterone and all that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so Jonathan, you had a pretty high response to dairy. Yeah, and dairy made you high. feel bad before. Yeah. And that just confirms kind of that maybe you should not be eating dairy. Check the box, right? Like, yeah. like, and it wasn't, I'm not doing this because it's like, man, I keep having this allergic reaction. I'm wondering what it's coming from. It's simply trying to optimize, you know? So I've already been avoiding dairy, so that's just fine. Uh, but some interesting things, like it brought up a bunch of different stuff. Like I said, 96 foods, and then it rates it on a spectrum. And that spectrum kind of has like, points or like a bracketed sections that are marked as, you know, mild or more severe all the way mm -hmm. up to severe. Hmm. And, uh, within that, <clears throat> there were definitely some surprising things like I ate eggs every morning, but egg whites actually was one of the highest ranked things. Egg yolk. No egg whites. Yes. Yeah. You, when we go race and stuff, you always do eggs. Yeah. Yeah. So you're going to stop that now. Yeah. So I've stopped it. Yeah. And, and the one interesting thing, and it's really hard because I'm not scientific right now in terms of like eating everything exactly the same. But I do notice that I feel like there's less mucus development, everything else when I'm not eating these eggs. Sounds like it. Yeah. yeah. No. <laughs> you sound it's just beautiful. My, it's just my vocal cords. <laughs> there's just nothing left of them, poor things. So, um, so yeah, it, but it's an interesting thing and, and it is, it's about a hundred dollars, I think, or maybe slightly over for, for that test. Uh, and that's USD. Um, and I'm not sure if they serve clients overseas, but it's a really interesting thing. And for a person that's a cyclist is trying to kind of split hairs and really make sure they get down to finding the best options instead of, you know, good, better, best and find the best ones. It's a really cool tool. It's it going to like give a... me a eating disorder. Yeah. I'm sure. Because <laughs> I'm sure it will. Uh, amongst uh, other things, there are 29 tests here. Did you really do all of them? No. Oh, okay. But a lot of them. <clears throat> okay. They're in the See, office. 28. So right 20. now I'm on. <laughs> just joking. Uh, <laughs> pretty close. I have, uh, we're, we're at dinner. I'm just like, yep, I'll get that. I'll get that. I'll get that. Um, I'm on prednisone right now because I'm getting another sinus surgery. Uh, oh. They're putting balloons in each one of my sinuses, blowing them up, putting a, what they call a cyclone. Crazy doctor name. Like cheek lift? Uh, <laughs> no, it shouldn't change the face, the structure of my face. But <laughs> it's, it's going to like clean it out and then they're going to culture it too before they clean it out and then put like antibiotic stuff in there to try to get rid of things because I keep getting sinus infections. One still is not draining. I might get one more surgery. Wow. Um, but I'm on prednisone one right now. One more surgery beyond this balloon surgery? Maybe. Depends on if this works. Um, oh. I'm on prednisone right now before because they want the inflammation to go away and I don't want to take the test during when I have prednisone because I think that might... I don't, I have no clue if this is it. So maybe a doctor can tell me. I think the prednisone might um, blunt some of the IgG response for yeah, these tests. for the tests. So I don't want to, I'm going to wait a couple of weeks so it's all the way out of my system. Yeah. I don't think anyone cares about that. But so once I do it, I'll put... A potent anti-inflammatory, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's amazing. It's crazy. You cannot, <laughs> so everyone knows, you cannot use it in competition. You can't. So it's cannot. illegal. Uh, it's, it's for everybody. But for out of competition, like you can take it and train and all that sort of stuff. Uh, but prednisone is a super strong drug, but also uh, yes. weight gain too. Yes, it does. Yeah. Um, but anyways, I'll put my results in cool. the forum because um, I think it's interesting to see uh, what kind of testing you can get done. Yeah, and if people want to see the same on mine, let me know. But I'm not going to go over my whole test There's here. It's too much. It's just 96 food items. I don't yeah. think we need to go through that. Avocados. Yeah, no. exactly. <laughs> Chad, you've been doing something recently with uh, with meat that you wanted to share. Yeah, um, yep. for, for other folks. It's, it's called, called uh, another healthy tip. Primalpastures.com. Uh -huh. 
And, uh, and, and once again, we, we, no one—they don't give us any money. Nobody's giving no. us anything. Please so. do though. <laughs> no, we just. <laughs> yeah. Well, take it. Yeah, but, uh, we're, no, we're, yeah. we're very concerned with the quality of the animal products we eat. Yeah, and sure. Probably equally as much the humanity with which the animals are treated. Yeah, so. if I if I could just interject one thing, your 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 fiance is also she's a she's a veterinarian. Yeah, so correct. so she's you know very tied into this and, and yeah yep. so. Uh, r- really simply, they, they call, uh, I'm going to use their words, ultra-quality, high animal wel- welfare, truly pasture-raised, organic, soy-free meats. Mm-hmm. It's that simple. But there are, there are other products. Like they do eggs, really good eggs, I might add. Um, bone broths. Uh, I saw a number of other things on there that I was surprised about. coffee. Collagen, I think. Yeah. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. In any case, we've, we've only just now touched on their website, been doing it for about a month, and we've had a number of their meat products, and everything has been incredibly good. Yeah. You pay for it, but again, you get what you pay for. Are you sharing it live? Yeah. Yes, Tucker. <laughs> so Good if you're job. joining us on YouTube, Very you cool. can see that live. The pictures, yeah. Tucker's sharing it right there. Those and you, pictures and you can look virtually amazing. tour their farms and just huh, see cool. that the animals so are. So what you're concerned about is high quality, no soy in it, grass fed. Mm-hmm. And yeah. all that. And, and the treatment of the animal, too. Yeah. <clears throat> and, and the treatment of the animal. So, I do believe that the animal's disposition and its perspective, the things it experiences, absolutely influences the quality of the food. 100% the truth. So it mm-hmm. tastes good? Oh, it tastes amazing. It, cool. it's, yeah. These are the best meats I've ever, ever eaten. Uh, one thing, if you couldn't do something like that, uh, we actually, um, so we, uh, I, I, best, I guess we have a subscription to a local farm that we have here, mm. and mm. we know the family really well. We know all that stuff. So it's like, this is like a Portlandia episode right here, but <laughs> um, but like we know the family really well, and we also know that like the quality of this, the food That's and everything else that they give them, um, and it's and it is expensive. But uh, one thing that we did, and now I'm not taking advantage of this, but like we have eggs that are delivered every single mm-hmm. week, and yeah. the eggs, <laughs> right? Yeah, shoot, great. <laughs> if, if anybody um, in the Reno Sparks area, no. entirely different. Oh, it's entirely different. Oh, no, no, no. Like it's it's a it's a different food. We have almost. friends who have chickens, and those eggs are you can't compare them to anything no, you get you in the can't. store, even the expensive ones. Different. But if anybody in the Reno Sparks area knows how I could get a line on raw milk or raw dairy products, that'd be super sweet. Yeah. So feel free to share that. Nate, you've got a healthy tip too. The best. <laughs> okay, <laughs> Tucker, let's cue up this picture I put in the. Uh, you got the picture, in the from the forum. Okay, so I I've heard about these things, but I finally bought one. Yeah. An air fryer. Yeah. An air fryer is just a a, a convection oven. That's, That's it. all it is. That's it. But it's got a super high fan, and mm-hmm. what it does is, you, it, frying's the wrong word, but yeah, it's really not a fryer. It replaces frying. So what you do is you put food in there, and because of the convection ovens, um, there's so much air going through it that it dries it out uh-huh. so it tastes like it's fried but it's not fried and mm. it dries it so quickly that it doesn't dry it all the way through but it'll yep. just dry the yeah so you don't surface. get like and and you can do like dehydration setting stuff but i'm just going to talk about the regular stuff so what i've done is uh make french fries in it so you can do potato a couple of potatoes add like one tablespoon of olive oil mm-hmm. and then you will make these fries Will yeah. you show the fries, Tucker? He's pulling them up right yeah. now. Yeah. Um, still <laughs> it is. They're amazing. Well, okay. They're like 80% to like fried. Um, to like real French fries. Yeah. But considering that you're not actually frying them and you're just eating a baked potato with a tablespoon of olive oil, yeah. no, that I've, is amazing. I've, I've said it a number of times. I mean, one of my favorite on the ride food has been French fries left over from whatever meal I had the night before. <laughs> but since I've given up deep fried foods, they're off, they're off the table, both literally yeah. and figuratively. Yeah. Now they're back on. So yeah. what you can do is... Uh, um, my kids will, the there fries. they are, zoom in on those, <laughs> click on that picture. Um, when, uh, I can't get my kids to eat the skin of a potato, no, right? No, Uh, unless it's fried, but they will eat these, like a Gobble. whole potato, right? Or sweet oh, yeah. potato fries. Um, you can also just throw like with a bagel in them, uh, we eat pizza in it. Um, my kids do eat some like white breaded, like sure. chicken nuggets things, but yeah. it tastes better in that. And it's a lot quicker than, uh. <clears throat> um, uh, like a regular like oven, toaster oven. Yeah. and it's super easy to clean. So we right. are in love. And you say it doesn't murder cold pizza? No. Like a microwave does? It, no. Oh, you would never microwave. I, yeah. One time. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> really, just <laughs> take, really just takes once. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it, it's really good uh, with a, kind of a crispy bottom. The other tip for reheating pizza is you do it on the stove, yeah. and you actually like fry it, yeah. and then you uh, you like tent a little bit of uh, tin foil over it to get the top like you don't want to steam it, but you get the top kind of melty, and yeah. then the the frying just put it in the pan, no oil, and it will <laughs> kind of get the bottom crispy. That's another tip. It takes a little bit longer, but the air fryer is much better. Okay. Yeah. Um, if you're gonna make potatoes, there's a whole bunch of or French fries. You can um, 
there's like soaking them and I think it really helps to get a french fry like maker mm -hmm. um, because getting the right uniform size like makes all the difference right um, then like cutting them yourself uh, and you can soak them but you can play around with it what we did is I bought a, a maker that was like industrial style I didn't realize it and I had to have yeah. like a screwdriver to take it apart and clean it yeah. but I went to Costco and I bought a whole bunch of Yukon gold and a whole bunch of russet potatoes I froze them then in individual packages yeah. and now we just uh, defrost them in water and then put them in fry them it's like in and out in there you're just it's, like I'm just like in and out nice uh, <laughs> sweet but anyways the kids my I can get my kids to eat just potato with olive oil or sweet potatoes before they yeah. wouldn't and mm. personally I love them they're good enough where uh I will not binge eat them but you know you just yeah. keep eating them until they're gone yeah. and it's just a potato for those that aren't for those that aren't parents you may not understand the value of that but when you have kids and they won't eat whatever the family's eating it adds yeah. a lot of stress it's you really have, hard you have like this ideal that my kids are going to eat like all of this wonderful food uh -huh. and they just say no they don't they because don't. they're kids <laughs> I, i've seen kids menus at every restaurant and i have to believe that's not just laziness at work there. No, it's it's there's a reason to it but yeah, if you can trick sure. them yeah, exactly. There <laughs> Trick we go. or bribe. Yeah, uh, it's amazing. So, anyways, air fryer. I use the Ninja one. Yep. and it's like a hundred bucks, hundred ten bucks. Uh, you can get bigger ones. Found but that Phillips one it was two fifty. That's just a bigger it's quite one. Quite a bit bigger. That one's bigger because you can put a whole chicken in it, huh. um, which you could. Sure. I'm sure it'll get air crispy, but chicken. man, yeah. there's Costco. Those chickens sure. for cheaper. Yeah. Than that, you know what I mean? You just pick one up. So if you go to the forum what and search, yeah, who knows? who knows? Oh yeah, if you're getting your primal point. meat, you can air fry it, get a crispy skin. Yeah. Yeah, that'd be pretty amazing. Uh, go to the forum and search for episode two thirty two, and you'll be able to see the links and pictures. And look at those French fries. Oh, and two, if you're gonna do Nate's at hungry. home, I know. <laughs> if you're gonna do at home French fries, uh, make sure you salt them because that's a big thing. If you like at a restaurant, they probably salt them more than you would think. Yeah, you wonder why they taste so different. It's because they use a, a whole bag of salt. Yeah, and if you <laughs> so, have high blood pressure, something watch out for. All of course. The stuff outside, but you're probably fine as endurance athlete. Let's jump down to Ryan's question. Cool. Uh, on our doc is number five, but he says, "Hey guys, in the previous episode talking about body composition." You mentioned about dropping weight to reach an optimal performance, but what about going the other way? So we've actually covered this pretty recently, and I just want to throw this in as like a disclaimer, but we wanted to address this question specifically because we feel like it's a great example of perhaps uh, misattribution, um, misunderstanding, what may be holding you back. Uh, and just as a recap, we talked about how to add, we just a few, I, I imagine it's somewhere in the two twenties. I can't remember the exact episode, but we discussed, and if you just Google ask a cycling coach weight gain, you'll be able to find it out. Uh, but we basically talked about how to add weight responsibly going through the whole process of training and everything else. And it was making sure you're fueling your workouts and then you can bring in extra as you wish strength training, that sort of stuff that can help. But all of that out of the way, let's get into, in this case, specifically Ryan's uh, situation. It says a little bit of context. I'm currently 65 kilograms, which is about 143 pounds and 180 centimeters at five foot 11 inches. So basically you. Yeah, super similar, similar body composition, or I should say not body composition, but height and weight. Uh, he says the last tested FTP was 248 watts. So I'm at 3.8 watts per kilogram. Currently in my second season of triathlon, focusing mostly on the half distance with a bunch of Olympics thrown in. Coming from a running background, so I'm fairly lightweight and currently average around 10 to 14 hours of a training a week, depending on how long I end up riding on the weekend. Due to the amount of training, I find that I struggle to put on weight. <clears throat> so these are where the assumptions are going to start to come in. Uh, <clears throat> he finds that he struggles to put on weight and would like to think that I eat fairly healthily, healthily and put the biscuit jar to work uh, or at work, but the biscuit jar at work says otherwise. So he's snacking basically is what he's getting out there. However, it still takes a conscious effort for me to eat enough food to not drop weight. And I've noticed that during group rides and draft legal races, I struggle to put out enough power during my time to pull when on the flats. But if there's a sustained hill, I easily find myself toward the front. Do you have any recommendations for people who are on the lighter end of the scale and wanting to put on more weight? Or is it just a case of making sure I'm fueled for the training and riding and bringing up my FTP to be able to pull when I need to? And he's kind of answered his own question if that was the case. But I don't think that his problem is being too light. Because at 3.8 watts per kilogram, while that is a high level of performance for, for many people, mm -hmm. relatively speaking, it's I don't think that it would be close to his genetic, genetic potential. potential. Yeah. Probably not. I mean, being his height and weight and having a 200, you know, I have like a 310 watt threshold. He has a 248 watt threshold. There's a big difference there. Um, we don't and, know how old Ryan is, right? No, yeah, but he's, uh, I assume he's somewhat middle-aged to, to younger. So, um, but looking at that, 
there's definitely some room. It's it's probably not the fact that you're too light. There's probably plenty you could do. Mm -hmm. um, and if you're snacking on a biscuit jar, in my mind, that sounds like you know that's not really a focus on high quality food. Yeah, you could uh, increase your performance probably just by instead of going so biscuit jar means cookies for us Americans. Mm -hmm. um, they're going to be higher in fat. Switching to I bet more carbs increase your volume. Mm -hmm. uh, you might be able to uh, raise your FTP. Mm -hmm. um, Whenever someone's like, I struggle to put on weight, and they're not like 18, it's like, I don't care. <laughs> like, next question. Yeah. All you got to do is eat more. Nate resents um, that. Yeah. But I mean, it's all, like, that's, if, that's, if you want to put on weight, like, mm -hmm. who cares about like the composition? You just physically eat more. And mm -hmm. uh, weight if will you happen. can't do that, <clears throat> uh, just eat regular french fries. So they have french fries. <laughs> uh, or like, I mean, there's a lot. If you just want to put on weight, there's lots of ways you can do that. But yeah, do but it healthily. I'm sure you're talking about usable mass. Yeah. Exactly. So um, if you want to, uh, eat more. Uh, Increase your protein intake. Time your protein. Yep. Post-workout, typically. Mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, probably lift some weights. Yeah, for sure. Yep. Mm -hmm. and, and when we're saying eat more, we mean <clears throat> eat well. Uh, not just eat more of whatever you're currently eating. If you really want to see a big improvement, a very diet. One thing that's really helped me is the endurance diet, that book by Matt Fitzgerald. He talks about how to bring in a whole variety of different foods and how to eat a very diet and make sure it's highly nutritious, mm -hmm. but also get the sort of carbohydrate density that you need as an endurance athlete to be able to carry on yeah. and the protein and everything and, else. And as endurance athletes, I mean, we're so... <clears throat> frequently undernourished or malnourished and it may not even be an intentional thing we just don't realize how much work we're doing relative to how much food we're, we're you know taking in uh, mm -hmm. over the course of a day so we can see dietary deficiencies in, in so many different manners i mean you could be short on certain micronutrients certain you know the quality of your macros may not be up to snuff you may not be timing it well you may not be fueling well enough during your workouts which mm -hmm. is easy to lose sight of you get done totally. and you're completely thrashed because you didn't eat enough on on the bike. I mean, I was guilty of that for I don't know how many years. Mm -hmm. um, another thing I want to say is that for Ryan, he is said he struggles to pull like hard enough on the group rides in the front. That might be in your head, and yes. you might be pulling too hard. Uh, Jose, who you've seen Jose like on our race series, he's the local sprinter. And those are on YouTube. You can yep. look up the race analysis series we do. He's a small dude, like five. He's got to be five, like five, four. five. Yeah. 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 Um, and his FTP is only like 220, mm -hmm. but he sprints like a maniac and he's super arrow. And he can still pull pretty darn well, well on the flanks. He, there's oh, yeah. a, there no, is a race you. video of him leading me out. Uh, we I did a very poor job, but <laughs> finishing it. But when he um, led me out, he's not doing that many watts. And I'm doing like 300 behind him. Yeah. Yeah. And he, he's got to be doing like 250 or, or less. You, I'm, I think I'm doing more than that. You don't have to be a big brawny roller type to, to go fast on the flats. And you yeah. look at like Nero Quintana used to get tailed off all the time. Now he hangs oh, in there yeah. just fine. Vincenzo Nibali can ride dang near anybody off his wheel if he oh. wants to. Look at Bargill. I mean, so, Bargill exactly. is a guy that's that's always like, and I, he's probably changing as we speak, right? But like, and yeah. I mean, he's the French national champion now. So, but when you looked at when he first was kind of coming in and blowing up, or that's a bad way to say it, but basically coming in and, and, and becoming the rider that he was known for, mm -hmm. super fast on the climbs, but if it got anywhere remotely close to flat, he was off. And we've yeah. seen that with a lot of riders. It's just another case where you need to avoid <clears throat> pigeonholing yourself simply based on your, your yeah. somatotype, your body type. Just 100%. Don't over pull on the front and just try to get arrow. Yeah. Because that's what you're going to need to do at... Uh, at uh, 5'11", sure. 143 pounds. And there's a thing to, to bring in, too, on the psychological effect. And also there is some some what of a you know physical one, too, that we're talking about. When you're on a grade and it's forcing you to constantly be putting out force like that, yeah. it's a, it's easier to hit your power targets. Yes. You know, uh, when it's flat, it's tougher for people. Psychologically, it's tougher because they're not being forced to do it. So they have to proactively do the work to stay there. Mm -hmm. um, but then also it's, it's, it's tougher on the, on the muscles to do something slightly different. Cause when you say that you're on a climb, Ryan, when you know, you're fine on climbs, 3.8 Watts per kilogram, isn't something that's outrageous in mm -hmm. terms of power to weight ratio on a climb. Yeah. Um, but <clears throat> so I would say that there's probably an experience component to this too. Absolutely. And, I mean, you know, doling out sustained power on a flat road, there is a learning curve there. You have to learn how to sustain that power yeah. steadily. It's, yeah. it's not as easy as on an incline. And Absolutely. Have you guys ever over pulled in a group ride or oh, seen someone else over pull? Of course. Oh, constantly. Yeah. Right? And you think you like get up there and you're like, I need to do my work. Like I need to contribute. Mm -hmm. And you're like, 
killing yourself and yes. you're like oh i'm just not a good flat person but what yeah. you really just did is you killed yourself you, show yourself. Yep. you did like yeah. vo2 max for a Every, minute and you're in your diet everybody else was pulling it you know threshold or maybe just slightly above and you're pulling it like 130 yeah, percent exactly and then you're wondering how everybody else is doing it yeah well they're just you know they're not yeah. pulling as hard <laughs> yeah, and it's exactly. it's hard like the little speed difference that you might have of one or two miles per hour you don't feel it and right. as the road two is like often undulating mm. it's hard to even know like keep the speed constant, right? Because oh, it yeah. goes up one percent, and you're like, I gotta keep the same no, speed. No, that's true. Because on a flat road, you can just use miles per hour. Just look at your speedometer, and you know when I pull through, I just need to hold this twenty six miles per hour that we're going. But when the road changes at all, mm -hmm. that speed becomes not useless, but not nearly as informative yeah. as it was on a flat road. And who has completely like unless you're in Florida, who has completely flat roads all the time with yeah. no wind as well? well. Oh yeah, and wind too. Once wind comes in, yeah. you know, yeah. and yeah, that's why it's so like one thing that Chad said very early on when I met Chad was like data should always inform perception. Mm. And it's a very, and I always think of that. And I, I, I think that's a relative strength that I have that I know exactly what a specific wattage feels like at that day. Now it may change if my fitness changes, right? But I know what that feels like and I pay attention to the feeling. And that's really when well, I'm pulling at the front of a group, it's I'm paying attention to the feeling. And I'm not paying experience attention Experience aside, to you know what's going to blow you up and what you can keep doing yeah. for a long yeah. time. Okay, on the opposite of this, how often do you, are you guys in a group ride and you're like, man, I just wish that guy up there would pull harder? Oh yeah, I've never had that. Very rarely, like never Unless once. I mean, ever. Ever. When, when someone takes a soft pull, it's a bit of a, re a respite. You know, you're just yeah, like, you're like count your oh, blessings, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, you're never upset. It, a race breakaway, that's all different. But just a group ride, and someone's like oh, yeah. not jamming it like some other high level athlete. It, mm -hmm. Nobody cares. No, it's nobody pleasant, cares, right? Yeah. yeah. So in in this case, Ryan, I, I think that you have room to grow in terms of your power. Um, and I would focus on raising your power, not on gaining weight. And the way that you focus on raising the power is really hitting your marks through training consistency and then fueling those workouts. And then stepping back from that on the experience side of things, it's also, it's okay and understand the fact that this is normal for being able to put out power on the flats and understanding how to dole out your efforts effectively mm -hmm. and in a measured way, that all takes time. So <clears throat> if you do think that you need to just gain weight and that's like the thing that's missing, eh, maybe not. Let's go into Dane's question. It says, four months ago, my wife and I added a second child to the mix. Congratulations, Dane. Well, it has been an exciting time for everyone. My training initially took a downturn, but over the past few weeks, I've been able to complete Sweet Spot Basement Volume 1, and I'm three weeks into Sweet Spot Basement Volume 2. That being said, in order to help, and those are our training plans for those that don't know. Um, those are one of the options that you can pick to go through the base phase. It says, that being said, in order to help out more in the evenings, I've eliminated the Wednesday recovery ride. How much of an impact is skipping the Wednesday ride having on my training? I know at some point a higher TSS will be required to achieve all the intended adaptations, but how much am I missing or really missing out on by skipping that ride each week is the question. Thanks to the podcast. No doubt the best in the business. Dane, that sounds like a, a testimonial quote we should have there. Thanks, Dane. Appreciate it. I feel like we should be on a billboard <laughs> that you walk by and it's just our three faces and like, it says the best in the business. Like, like law with firms. Air quotes. Yeah, like law. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. A law firm billboard. <laughs> That's exactly what I was thinking. <laughs> nice. Um, so Chad, I guess, what would you say since you're obviously the creator of these plans, that sort of thing? What would you say to an athlete that's skipping, um, and that, or to Dane in this case, that's skipping that recovery mm -hmm. ride on Wednesday? Well, first off, those Wednesday rides in the mid-volume plans are the first sacrificial lambs. You know, and sacrificial lamb being you know, something that you sacrifice for the greater good, mm -hmm. the greater good being improved performance here. So if for whatever reason you need to skip a ride because you're tired, because your schedule won't allow you to train you know, four or five days that week, that's the first ride that goes. It's the least impactful. And it's not a recovery ride. These are aerobic rides. Um, in some cases, they are recovery oh, okay. rides. Sorry. It depends. Mm -hmm. What plan are we talking about? Sweet spot? Sweet yeah. spot base. Yeah, those, 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 like those, are, it, right? those are legit. No, some of them are like Taku and Dan's. Oh, okay. And they're, yeah. mm -hmm. they're recovery Taku rides. And Dan's are yep. Yeah. So, but anytime you're overly fatigued, that's the first ride that goes. Anytime mm -hmm. your schedule is a little bit compromised, that's the first ride that goes. I mean, like I said, it is the least impactful of the workouts. And it's not strictly a way to get on and, and amass more TSS. I mean, if we were just looking right. to amass TSS, we can only apply that to very narrow situations where your training is super homogenous, where you're not changing anything else, you're simply ratcheting up TSS. But when mm -hmm. the type of training changes, when when we move into a different plan, and I mean, uh, so many other things change, your, your threshold bumps up. There are a lot of other ways to advance your performance without simply increasing your TSS. Mm -hmm. So don't don't ever look at it as a, as a, a TSS filler. 
because mm. it's not really what it's for. And when they are legitimate recovery rides, these 30 minute to 45 minute rides, those are specifically so you can get on and spin the, spin the legs and facilitate lymph removal and get the blood circulating. It's not supposed to really put, impose any muscular stress on your system. Hmm. Yeah. And I, I see, I mean, most of us, we, well, all of us live the real life, which is an imperfect life, which is something that constantly changes, right? Mm -hmm. That's deep, dude. Yeah, sorry. All of yeah. us live real life. <laughs> we do. We live real life. Um, but so this is like, uh, we get this question all the time. Like, I did, wasn't able to complete this workout. Mm -hmm. What do I do? And a lot of the time, I feel like if I look forward in the week and I try to be diligent about scheduling my week, then I can see, you know what? This week is going to be really tough to fit in one workout. And I may need to kind of like reschedule things around and kind of shift things around. And like Chad said, if you are going to cut one, this is one to mm -hmm. cut. So, but and do know that sometimes I use those uh, recovery rides in a mid volume plan just to get you on the bike another day mm -hmm. during the week for a number of reasons. Um, in, in some cases, I'll actually add a meaningful workout, a more meaningful workout in that time slot. Uh, I understand that people do want to in some cases advance from a mid volume plan to a high volume plan. And this kind of paves the way for that transition. Mm -hmm. So, so do try not to lose sight of the fact that just being on the bike an extra day a week has its own benefits, even sure. if the intensity of the workout is low. But if you're going to have to make a cut, this is the first That's one. That's the do. one that goes first. And two, uh, Dane, like, so I've increased my volume a ton over the last few years where low volume used to like kill me. Yeah. Right. I'm in a high volume, volume, high volume plan right now and I'm like, I can do more, which is amazing yeah. I, personally. And what that was, was being patient, sometimes impatient, mm. if impatient I get knocked back, right? But being patient over actually seasons of this and as you go through sweet spot basement volume, you'll learn and you'll get to a point where you're like, yeah, I can do Wednesday. Like mm -hmm. you wake up Wednesday morning and you're like, yep. Hey, that's this sounds good today to do this. Yeah. And that's when you add it. And it's tough to see that long term. It's really hard to look at things in terms of one, two, or three seasons from now. Yeah. And imagine, you know, if I take this slowly and I do everything right, I will actually be able to do this and benefit from it and do more. Yeah. I look in at, seasons ahead. I look at my TSS chart and I go to four years on the website hmm. and you can draw this line of my like six week average and it just goes up and up and up. And over the last two years, it's kind of been been flatter. But as you said, Chad, it's been at a higher FTP. Mm -hmm. So I actually am doing more work. Mm -hmm. And then this last year, I started doing more two hour workouts. Um, and now that I'm coming to our workouts that maybe aren't as intense and now I'm doing sweet spot base high volume one, sweet base one high volume. They're a little bit more intense during the week, mm -hmm. but less time. And it's, that's been a great switch where less less volume, but yeah. more intensity because sure. I'm doing more sweet spot daily. And um, I know I'm sick right now, but my son's sick. Everyone's sick. Everyone's uh, sick. Everyone right at now. our kid's school is sick. I'm fine. I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah, you so. sound fine. <laughs> but anyways, just be, I just want to say that it's, it's okay to skip. The consistency is what's important. And consistency over a season, yeah. you'll be able to um, apply more. And then also, um, to me, I've mentioned this a thousand times, but nutrition. Really getting like nearly yep. your nutrition. We mentioned endurance diet, eating a bunch of plants um, helps yeah. a lot. And those French fries, man. Yeah. <laughs> it's going to Game Joe's changer. question, which has no relation to, to me at all in this case. He says, as it's flu season in the Northern Hemisphere, I thought I'd ask about the physiological impact of these colds and flus. We've all heard that to, that stopped, or we've all heard to stop training if an illness symptoms go below the neck. This is like the old, like, like a wives tale advice sort of a thing, right? Yeah, like, I think it's <clears throat> and he says, but what is questionable? Yeah. What is it that's happening to stop us? The muscles are still there. Presumably the glycogen is. So apart from feeling terrible, what's stopping us from training and benefiting from training when sick to be clear, this is just for interest sake. I'll be hiding under my duvet at the first sign of a sore throat. <laughs> Cheers from Joe. That, that is the distinction too, right there. Cause yeah. nothing's stopping you from training aside from good sense. Yeah. yeah. But <laughs> So much is stopping you from benefiting. Yes. I mean, you have to look at your body in terms of its its resources, and it has a finite amount of resources. You can only do so much. You can only handle so much stress, and that stress comes at all angles, and illness is one of those stressors. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to pile training stress on top of an illness stress, in addition to any other forms of stress you're, you're dealing with, you can't expect to... To, to heal, to get faster, to accommodate everything else. Yeah, your body's immune system is is absolutely tied into the constant training and recovery and adaptation process. Mm -hmm. and you're distracting and, it. You're uh, taking resources away. Yes, and, and a lot of people think, well, if I can just train through my illness, I'll eventually get better, and I won't have lost any fitness. Yeah. But it just it simply doesn't work that way. Yep. Give yourself a little time off. 
get healthy, move past the illness, resume training. Yeah, and this varies for different people. You'll find out what works best for you. For me, what I've found, so like this week, during all the time that I've had scheduled for my workouts, I've actually, which it's you know 90 minutes a day roughly that I've had scheduled this week, I've taken those times and I've taken a nap. So like I'm, I'm doubling down on my recovery because I'm trying to get better yeah. uh, quickly through the whole process. In this case, I'd call that sleep training. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that, and that's just the, and for me, I've found that if I try to rush back into training, I prolong the illness and then my training isn't productive and I don't see a lot of improvement. Yeah, it just and it's kind of this like yo-yo scenario. Yeah. And it's kind of like, okay, well, I don't know when I'm actually going to start to get the normal benefit that I should expect from this training. And I'm just kind of trucking through and making myself worn down. Small things like this that can derail an entire season. One mm-hmm. little setback leads to another setback leads to another. And it's this whole two steps forward, one step back sort of thing. Yep, exactly. So my personal advice is to double down on recovery rather than double down on or trying to you know train with a body that's distracted by trying to to recover from an illness so i don't do any of that <laughs> <laughs> you just jam the print his own hop on the bike going. no I, this, this is a unique situation right now but <laughs> i get a cold i go through the cold pretty well i think i can train through a cold i like my immune system fighting colds is awesome i'll be good in like a day yeah then four days of lull, then I get a sinus infection, and it's like two to three weeks of antibiotics and crazy stuff. That's where you get stuck. And yeah. if I, so I could stop training for literally a month while I wait. Yeah. And lose like 700 mm. watts on my FTP. That's and, this guy. And I'm, no, but you know what I mean? It's just a lot. Uh, yeah, I get it. Yeah. I've never heard somebody use losing 700 watts on their FTP. I'm, I'm exaggerating. Yeah. Of a percentage. <laughs> oh, you are? Good. Yeah. Good to know. Um, no, but I, the, then the other side of this too, somebody's probably yelling into their, whatever they're listening to right now. Nate, if you didn't train through the cold, you probably want to get a sinus infection, that's but that's not thinking. really I've the done case because like just... you've done that and you, you're just, a, you are, you There's are very productive at creating sinus infections. Yeah. Very uh-huh. productive at that. I have a low IgG3, uh, which means I have problems fighting upper respiratory symptoms. And I also have structural things where right now I can feel it. Uh, I've had a two sinus surgeries and they've helped, but there's one that just pull pools here. Yeah. I've got pictures. I take pictures now. The no, mucus, thank you. It'll be this huge blob <laughs> no, that builds you. up. It like builds up and then all comes people out. People are probably once. eating while well, listening to they're this. They're eating those. Yeah. Not. Now, <laughs> yeah, now people they're in the, <laughs> they were talking about getting hungry for the French fries and to stop it. But yeah. it's because I have to show, uh, anyways, I got a new ENT. We'll see what happens with yeah. this stuff. Hopefully I can prevent it because then I'll be just watch out. Guys. Is it one surgery for sure? No, they're going to, well, the balloon thing's for sur- sure. It happens yeah. in two weeks, Okay, um, but they're going to blow it up and clean it out. They're also going to culture it because it, yeah. I don't think it's fungal, but it could be something else or I could get sure. a gram so negative bacteria, which is something that's really hard to get rid of. Okay. And that's just an outpatient affair. I yep. assume. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, and then after that, we're going to see what happens and maybe the, ex- with the balloon expansion, I'm not sure how, if that's really long term or not, we'll fix it. Um, but if it does fix it, then I won't have another surgery. But if I keep pooling right here, mm. um, they're going to wait till I get infected again. They're going to scan it and then see what's, what's Got wrong. It. Yep. Uh, mm. Matt's question is perfect for you, Nate. He says, thanks for the great podcast and great app. However, I feel I should admit I haven't been using Train Road for a couple of months because I'm enjoying riding outdoors on hills and single track on my gravel bike three to five days a week because I can. Stopped there. Matt, we're not answering your question anymore. We have outside workouts. There is no excuse. You can follow this. Yes. Um, so it's awesome. though. Uh, I actually just got a new Garmin head unit too. And I had the 820 before, but I'm going to have the 830 now. And it's got a better workout experience, so I'm yeah, excited to use it. Awesome. The Wahoo experience is really good too, like really good. You can like, uh, you just use the button. And you can like scroll through or back through your intervals. Hmm. So then, like, because uh, I'm sure you guys have had this when you're riding outside and trying to do workouts, you get to a spot and there's like a car, so you have to wait for the turn, or you know, you just want it. You haven't quite gotten to the spot. It's so easy with this one, with the Wahoo one, because you can just skip back to the beginning of the interval. You just tap a button, and then you, and then it counts you in from three. Like, Super cool. So, Matt, train outside. If you're not training all the times, you're getting slower. Have structure and purpose outside. Exactly right. Just right. riding. Exactly right. Unless you're in the 35-plus Northern California. Yeah. Just, just ride, dude. <laughs> just ride. <laughs> Get the miles in. <laughs> Get those Ks. Yeah. yeah, just put in the Ks. That's all you're going to do. And, of course, we also recognize the fact that sometimes just riding a bike is nice. We get that, too. Um, but we're advising on how to get faster. So, so winning. That's it. Uh, he says, uh, okay, so he says, 
Um, but he did saying this. He says, I'll get back on the turbo with Trainer Road soon as I'm getting annoyed that my Garmin head unit keeps declaring my rides as unproductive. Eh, it said it, not us. So <laughs> he says, anyway, my question is probably more a vanity question than anything else. I'm fortunate to live in a place with hills, some of them relatively long or steep or long and steep. And these are more extreme when riding on the trails. I can put decent power, put out decent power numbers on climbs and flats, but of course what goes up must come down. On the downhills, sometimes I'm out of gears, or other times I simply don't want to go faster. It's probably safe. And he says, and in those times, I may simply want to easily spin the legs to flush them. These light spins typically show as 40 to 80 watts. So my question, do these spins negatively affect normalized power, or is there a threshold for a data point to be included in normalized power, like, for example, 30 watts equals X percentage of FTP. Yeah. I think that what he's getting out there is like below a certain threshold, it like considers yeah, yeah. it like zero and, yeah. and doesn't, that doesn't keep it in. So thanks for the great app and keep up the podcast. First, I think we've um, up here in Reno, we've experienced this where you do a long descent and you don't pedal yeah. and then you get those first pedal strokes and it's like, whoa, what happened? Yeah, right? yeah. So it's probably good. Chad, don't you think that he's doing some light spins like mm -hmm. while he's going down to keep it active? Yes. Yeah, cool. Yeah. So if you're in a race, you get a long descent like that. Like we have 20 minute descents. Oh yeah. Uh, and 20 minutes of no pedaling, it's bad. When it's you, bad. When you start up. If nothing else, you want to keep the muscle pump going so your blood circulates. Otherwise, it, it does pool in your legs to some extent. Okay. Yeah. So uh, I'm gonna explain normalized power and average power, and then how we do this and how you get it. So average power, I think that's easy, right? That's the average power you do over a set time. Mm -hmm. The problem with that for measuring performance is that zeros in that pull down your average a ton. Yes. So a couple zeros make it look like you're not working very hard at all. And Dr. Andrew Coggin recognized this and he came up with, he developed a new power metric called normalized power. And what normalized power is supposed to do is say, if you were going to be like, have an average, um, it, it's supposed to, if you like have a more spiky output, so uh, not consistent, like what could you have held if you were consistent? Mm -hmm. This, of course, and he'll be the first one to say this, this isn't 100% accurate. There's what he calls NP busters if you're going like really hard and off. But I think it's the best way that we have to compare similar efforts on the bike that you're doing. It feels like when I, <clears throat> in a criterium or road race or time trial, move them all, you know, put all of those races together. I feel like if I look at average power, it doesn't represent how the ride felt as closely as normalized power does. Exactly. Yep. It's kind of the goal, right? And then we use normalized power to get things like intensity factor and training stress. Mm -hmm. But normalized power in itself does not know what your FTP is. So whatever your FTP is, you can have it be a thousand or zero. Normalized power is not impacted at all. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm going to talk very briefly about how it's calculated. Um, but basically the 40 and 80 watts will actually um light spins will increase your normalized power versus zeros but not by much so okay i probably shouldn't be doing this but we'll just do it <laughs> um so what you do is you calculate the 30 second rolling average of your power data you raise these values to the fourth power you average these results and then you take the fourth root um so basically the fourth power it's weighting the really high power spikes a whole bunch more mm -hmm. than the uh than the low values and could i interject really quick there no <laughs> carry on then <laughs> no, just, I'm, just kidding. I'm done <laughs> um the, what i wanted to end the reason that it's doing that Thanks. though the reason that it's doing that is because if you think about it every watt that you step up it isn't it doesn't take the same amount of energy to get those watts right mm -hmm. i mean it's it's harder to to go 300 to 310 than it is to go zero to 10, yeah. right? It takes a lot more work. Or so. a thousand, right? Correct. Uh, so, <laughs> and, and if you go to like wattage forum stuff, people have debated a ton, well, why not 3.8? Why not 4.1, right? Mm -hmm. Like, how'd you get fourth? And basically just chill, that's what we have. So, <laughs> I like that. <laughs> right, like, like that. It, it, yeah. and this is like, this isn't the end all be all. And this is just sure. like we've talked about before. Some people get obsessed with TSS, like you, you raise your FTP by 10 watts and then you're doing the same TSS, you're physically doing more work. Yep. Like you don't have to always be ramping all the time with yep. TSS. And people like in specialty phase, uh, we will be working more on like specific power and really mm -hmm. intense workouts and your mm -hmm. TSS might be a little bit lower. Um, and that's only because of normalized power but don't worry about it. Like we you're, wanna- You're be, getting faster, you're gonna race better. Yes, yep. the, the end output which so many people have problems with in all of uh, nutrition and uh, endurance stuff is for us at least is to be faster. That's it. And if you're getting faster, not to drive a specific number. Up. Exactly. It's not how much TSS you have because some people get 
confused that I cannot be faster unless my, my, my CTL is a certain number or yeah. something like that. Um, so in general, your light spinning is actually increasing your noise power, but not for very much. I think it's, it's uh, I could do the math and figure it out, but I won't. Um, probably just a few watts mm -hmm. um, and zeros. I don't even don't worry about that, but this is a good idea to light spin on long descents. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's not, and for I think a lot of people worry about the the vanity side of things, and he kind of mentions that that in the question that it's Get over like, it. yeah, yeah, right, exactly, that your your numbers are getting drugged down. Well, that's just is what it is. Again, are you getting faster or not? And if you're, yeah, if you're going down a hill and you're trying to pedal just to drag your number up, you know what I mean? That's you know, dra drag your brakes and pedal if you want, if you really want to drag your number. I love up. how his Garmin, like how like kind of passive aggressive, <laughs> super no, passive -aggressive, unproductive, right? Yeah, <laughs> actually <laughs> uses that term. Yeah, yeah unproductive. Yeah. yeah, it does. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah, unproductive training load. I want you Matt stimulus. to do a train road outside workout and do like antelope on it, which isn't a sweet spot. Sure. Five times ten minutes, something like that. Um, and then see what it says. I yeah. bet you it's not going to say unproductive. <laughs> it will not say right? unproductive. Yeah, that's for sure. You know, it's funny whenever I do outside rides uh, or outside workouts, you know, my normalized power is so much higher than if I just went out and I did some hard efforts or whatever it is because it's like properly structured. Yeah. And that's like everybody always comments. They're always like, whoa, that's like a super high NP for that ride. And it's like, well, yeah, because, you know. You're doing a workout. Workout. Work was being done. There's so, purpose. Mm-hmm. Um, let's jump back up to the third question on our doc, uh, gents from Chris. He says, uh, specifically to me, he says, hi, Jonathan, I wonder whether I could ask you about your experience with elite rollers versus a kicker or neo type of trainer, please. So basically rollers versus a smart trainer is what he's asking. Are there certain types of workouts where you'd choose one type of trainer over another? I have a neo and I'm really tempted by the elite Nero rollers. Those are the new ones that they have that um, have smart control, but they also have that really clever boom rack system. Are you getting those? Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, I am. Cool. Yeah, so I want to give them a shot. I rode yeah. them at Eurobike Yeah. and they were very quiet. That's actually like the main, it's not that I miss smart control as much as when I rode them, I was like, ooh, they're like perfectly silent. We have them at home then? Um, yeah, those ones are going to be at home. Can you still travel with those or not? Do yeah, they, they, they fold, fold up. up as well? Yep, yeah. yeah. In fact, Tucker's pulling them up. If you're watching on YouTube right now, you can see them. They actually fold up so that the entire trainer sits on top of the rear base of that trainer. Um, so it's and it's got a carrying handle that's built in. It's a very clever system that they have. So um, we'll get into those in just a bit. But he says, I've never loved the fixed rear end and to compound things, the LA winter training bike I built up recently. He says, it's the Sagan Aero frame set. That's a nice, that's a, that's a pretty bike uh, for a winter training bike. And he says, with mechanical Ultegra, which is very nice, it has through axles for which the tax adapters aren't a snug fit. I've come across this too, like with the through axle adapters, it's if you're like it can be hard to get it to fit really really tightly depending on the bike because everything kind of varies now you know? the best is uh you get the h2 or h3 which i'm in love with yeah and uh you use your own through axle and it's super good right it's solid. rock salt right yep. chad yeah i love it yeah, yeah. And yeah. I, best trainer side side note i just got the h3 it is silent is like it I really? hear my drivetrain more than the than the chamber. That is so cool. I, I I got it and I haven't used it yet. Now that yeah, you it goes bring in this weekend. Now that you bring that up, I could always hear you train. Last the week before, I guess two weeks ago. Yeah. Were you, were you using it? I don't know. But I think you were because I, I just, could not hear your. Oh yeah, workouts. it was. Yeah, two weeks. Yeah. Yeah, yeah yes. which I can usually hear your trainer from you know across, across the, the office, office yeah. basically. So hmm. yeah, interesting. Uh, so he says that he's never loved how that's kind of fit. And, and especially I know that bike's really pretty too. So like aside from the structural issues, also, you know, you don't want to mar up a pretty bike that you got. Yeah. He says this means that the rear, at, rear end actually wobbles slightly up and down, not side to side. I'm sure I can fix this, but I'm leaning toward rollers. It'd be great to hear any insights you care to share either here or on the podcast. Uh, thanks for everything you do for us. So uh, stepping back, first things first, on the rollers, I have the Elite Quick Motion Rollers. Uh, I went to those because I just got tired of the stiff bike feel. I also did, I like, you know, for a couple years, I just trained in erg mode and I wanted to try something different. And it was actually because I was creating a virtual power uh, profile. So we have a, for those who don't know, a feature called virtual power. You don't have to have a power meter to train with power or you get the benefits of it, just a speed sensor. And what we do is we kind of generate these, these power curves that we use to then figure out whatever um, wattage you would be putting out theoretically if you're riding at that speed on that given trainer. So I rode rollers and like fell off and hit walls and stuff like that uh, for a bit uh, in that process. And then I was like, oh, actually, this is kind of cool and this is uh, enjoyable. So, uh, yeah, I love it. And I do all of my workouts, whether it's micro bursts, whether it's sustained efforts, whether it's the ramp test, every single workout. And I get this question on Strava every single workout that I do, it seems like. All of them are done on the rollers. 
There's no issue there. You get to a point where um, the cognitive load for riding the rollers seems to disappear. I know it's still there, but at least your body seems to adapt. And the numbers that I get when I'm training on that are they uh, are a very good benchmark. I, I don't feel like when I take a test on that, I get a lower FTP, for example. Mm -hmm. Um, and the interesting thing with that too, with those rollers, I have a mid compact. So a 52, 11 would be my biggest gear mm -hmm. on my Venge with just normal road tires. And I can sustain about 500 Watts with that for almost every workout I do at a 310 F Watt FTP. That's plenty fine. Uh, yeah. and if I spin up really quickly and accelerate, I can peak up to like 800 or 850. So it's enough resistance and they have plastic rollers. So they're really quiet. They're not like the really loud steel drum rollers yeah. that you see. Um, so those are really nice. And then elite their new Nero rollers just add smart control to it. So you can pair it via Bluetooth and it'll adjust the resistance for you as you do cool. it. Curious to see how that goes. Yeah, yeah, I'm curious to see them. Now, stepping back from that, really good tips on the on the H3 being a clean setup to have there. And then also I saw that Canyon um, just released like a list of approved bikes. It's just so weird because like, no one else has ever approved <laughs> no, bikes no. for trainers. They all just Any work. Bike. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, think, I don't know. I think so. Uh, That's my list. I, yeah, marketing. I think, I think marketing was driving yeah. that for sure. Um, but it just shows the fact that like there's a lot of concern. And, and Shane Miller has has mentioned this plenty of times. He tries to like break the trainer, like physically break it because he's riding really hard on it and break bikes. And Shane would have probably broken like ten bikes by now, right? Yeah. Maybe even more. But he never has. Um, GP uh, Llama is how he's. I've never heard anybody doing it. So That's already like the bike wasn't already cracked. Yeah, exactly. Right. Uh, yeah. I could see though for marketing. Good on Canyon because you like if you don't know this, you yeah. look and be like, "Well, Canyon's approved, mm. specialized. None of these are approved. I need a Canyon. I, yeah, I gotta get a Canyon. <laughs> I want to ride indoors. Yeah, yeah. So clever to them. One other thing that I want to take a chance. This is basically us answering the questions that we get on Strava every single week. Nate, you get a question on every single one of your rides. I swear, um, everyone. Yeah, which question is it? <laughs> it's Nate. How'd you get so many speed or end or miles? <laughs> there, there, there's, there's two different ones. One is. Like, I'll go two hours and we'll say I want 50 miles. Like, hey, that's a lot of speed or miles. How did you do that? Um, and that is because I'm in erg mode. So everyone, when you're on the trainer, speed distance does not matter. It's irrelevant. You're not moving. Yeah. You're flat. I think I did like 500 miles last month. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And you can't. And you and, didn't go anywhere. And it's not really worth estimating just because of the fact that, you know, it's, it's so, because, it's so, so we thought about it like so many times, but it doesn't make you faster. And I think we'll just get nitpicked. Yeah. Like, oh, I should have been 23 miles, not 22 miles. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I kind of just want to be like no speed or distance, but then people revolt too. Yeah. Uh, anyways, don't worry about the speed or distance um, at all. It, does, it means nothing. It just means what nothing. gear you are on in erg mode. Okay. Right. The other one is uh, I will sometimes do the workout in resistance mode. I am not right now because I'm in between power meters. I'm using the H3, so it's just all erg mode. Mm -hmm. But uh, I do enjoy doing workouts in resistance mode. And so those who don't have a smart trainer, uh, don't feel like you have to get a smart trainer. Like both of us, Jonathan and I, oh, yeah. we do majority That's... of our workouts mm -hmm. without erg mode mm -hmm. and we get uh, honestly, pretty darn ex fast. Yeah. The, the yeah, yeah. <laughs> to tutor on the, <laughs> No, <laughs> the, relatively the, fast too. The interval precision is there's, if anything, sometimes it feels even more accurate than what you might get with erg. Like, yeah, exactly. Like you're able to really define when you change that. So I enjoy. I don't, don't want to give any, anybody the impression that I think erg is the only effective way to train. For it's sure. Just, it's what I use all the time. But that's because that's what I'm familiar with. I mm -hmm. went through a long phase of non-erg training. Yeah. And then our, <clears throat> when I ran indoor power, every weekend was, was non-erg rides mm -hmm. and they were super fun and very productive. The only time I feel like I really miss erg is when I'm doing something like Baxter and I have some show or yeah. something that I have going or I race. always do erg on Baxter or aerobic rides. Right, exactly. Because then it's nice to have it just take care of things yeah, in the background. Tuned. Yeah. Let's get into some live questions. Ooh, George, it's the first one. Yeah, Ooh. right. Sounds good. Um, so he says, what gear to use in erg mode? Uh, he says, hi, guys. This has been a bit of a hot topic on the forum, but I'm still a little confused. Which gear should I use in erg mode? Is it as simple as TT and triathletes use the big ring and climbing, et cetera, use the small ring? Uh, my personal advice is to use what you will use on race day if you have such a thing, like a, a goal event, right? It's going to be dependent on the flywheel size because what you're looking to, you're trying to figure out, uh, replicate your outside inertia. Yeah. So if you have a, uh, a, a smart trainer with a small flywheel, you're probably going to want to do a big, I'm, I'm, I'm a fan of big each time. Um, one way you can tell, like if you start training inside, and there's a big difference between your indoor and outdoor 
FTP. Some of that might be inertia based. So get in a big gear. Mm -hmm. um, if there is no difference, and maybe you're a mountain biker, or you're going to be doing like, it's like a lot of low inertia riding, try doing a smaller gear and see how it is. The other benefit <laughs> of a smaller gear is um, it's gonna be quieter on just about every trainer mm -hmm. because that belt's going slower. That's why I stay and, in a smaller gear, just that reason. Yeah, mm -hmm. and it will do um, less, uh, like it'll stretch, stretch, uh, stretch your chain at mm -hmm. a slower rate, mm -hmm. which is, I don't know if that's really a, um, Brandon Need here, he's he's like, it's gonna stretch my chain and he can't do it. <laughs> so he always has to be in a small gear. But um, ideally you line it up too so that you have a pretty straight Straight chain, yeah, yeah, uh, so. yeah. But it's just the amount of like uh, when you when you spin up that big flywheel, it's just more force on the chain rather for than for that brief period of time. Exactly. What yeah. do you consider the H two H three big flywheel? Huge, huge. Yeah, that's what I amazing. Yeah. yeah, that's why I like it too. Yeah. Is having that huge flywheel. It feels it feels nice. It feels like you're feels ripping like down the road. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's yeah, right. With it and with the H three being super quiet, then I'm I'm just gonna use a big gear now because I always put it in <clears throat> small ring and maybe like 15, 17 Yeah, in the rear just to keep the chain straight and to keep the noise down. Yeah. But I yeah. do like the, the yeah. high inertia. And I'm not in the like the eleven because uh, I want a, a straighter chain because yeah. I don't like to have that little rub the whole time. Sure. Yeah, it's a noise. Yeah, yeah. It's noise. always there. Who needs that, right? So. Yeah, and, and honestly, we're, we're, this is like a marginal gain because you're still doing the wattage, right? Um, if you're if you're using erg mode, something like that, you're still hitting your marks. But if you just want to go the extra mile, you would do this. So if you are too, so if you're in a small ring and you're having problems hitting it, and you think you should be able to do it, try it in a big gear and see what happens. Just it feels try it. easier for almost everybody I've spoken to, right? Yep. It feels easier when you're in that bigger ring and yep. you're able to have a lot of momentum kind of behind yep. you. Uh, let's go into New Jersey dad, I assume. Uh, let's, do, his let's do Jones because I can answer okay. that super quick. Cool. Awesome. Sounds good. Uh, when can an athlete donate blood if training? He says, hi, I'm from Toronto. When would be a good time to donate blood if you're in the midst of a block? And would it be best done during a rest week perhaps or does it really, ma really matter? It matters a heck of a lot. Hmm. So <clears throat> I did look this up and I was going to, I probably should have just mentioned it when I was talking about blood donation. But uh, your plasma volume recovers like within a day, super fast, but your red blood cell count isn't going to come back up for anywhere between four to six weeks. Wow. So it's quite a long time. So because of that, you're going to have some decrement in performance capability over the course of that entire four to six weeks. Mm -hmm. So there's really no good time. There, yeah. There's just not. I mean, I definitely wouldn't do it just prior to something important or meaningful like a race, so, mm -hmm. you know, any, any priority really. Yeah. So just know that you're going to be, it's going to knock you down for a little while. I actually um, have stopped giving blood because I've found that my energy levels drop so much. I've even had fainting episodes and everything else after giving blood. Um, it seems to hit me really hard and I haven't done it. Also, I have O positive blood. So they come after me like vampires. Yeah, They're yeah. like, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Good to know. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> We're traveling with this guy. <laughs> yeah. So it's like, uh, but I've noticed that it outside of just training, like I wouldn't even, I wouldn't dare be, you know, there's no way I could train, but pretty rough so and i know I somebody's some that jonathan blood <laughs> oh boy out in the youth uh, i'm gonna get people yeah i'm gonna get like a bunch of calls and emails now uh, from from blood donation places uh nj dad says having knee pain after doing a century i changed my cleat position inward to move my feet outward pain had been mild now to non-existent how hard should i train until this completely passes so first thing I would ask is why did you move your cleats? And mm -hmm. was that like a, an advised decision by somebody, the, like a, a, an educated third party? Or was this a situation where you were just like, hey, I feel like it works, which that doesn't necessarily mean it's wrong. Yeah. But it, changing cleat position has a huge effect. And like Pete Morris here, he has to have extra wide pedal spindles because his hips are wider. He's got birth and hips. <laughs> <laughs> That's what he says. Huh? That's true. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, and <laughs> and if he changes that, and Pete has serious issues, like he's changed shoes before, yeah. and then the cleat's been off, and he's had like really bad knee issues. Um, so, in terms of of how hard you should train until this completely passes. So I'm probably going to be erring on the side of caution here because I've dealt with a knee injury that was multiple years of trying to get rid of the thing. And it's because I was asking this very question. It was how hard I should train instead of should I just take time off? Um, my personal opinion is if you have something that you know is like a, an injury, like just watch your knee when you pedal. If it's not tracking straight, and if you don't feel like you're really using a lot of your glutes and you're reusing and uh, you know all of the muscles in your leg when you pedal, if you feel like some of them are turned off, you need to spend some time to figure out how to turn those on and let the inflammation go down in the knee and then you can get back into it. And there's a whole post that I have on different exercises I've done to do that very thing. If you go onto the forum and look up knee injury, you'll see the post I have even with like images on the different exercises I've done and lots of people sharing the same. So I don't know if you guys would share anything different. I do. 
Yeah. Um, so, NJ Dad, if you change your cleat position and the pain goes away, I wouldn't worry about That's it. That's a win. Yeah, it's a win, and yep. I would not change your training. If you change your cleat position and like you're, you know, you're injured, and you have to, I would, I would actually give some time for your knee to heal before you train some more, mm -hmm. um, because yeah, if it inspired an actual injury, you got to heal. Yeah, because you can. It could be in the right position, but you could still, because you have an injury, it could just not ever get better. Yeah. Even doing taku every day, if it's running it through the range of motion where the pain is manifest and you're not pushing really yeah, hard it on hurts. it, yeah. it's, that's still think of all the service. repetitions that you're doing. So heal first, and then, uh, and then these can be knee, well, these can be really tough as Jonathan yeah, knows. Oh, yeah. it's, it's, a, it's kind of a big deal, even the most subtle changes, because I, mm. I changed shoes one point, at one time way back, didn't realize one of the cleats was canted just a little bit, mm. got to the point where I had water on my knee, and I was starting to freak out, I'm thinking about I'm going to have to go see an North Pod. I'm going to have to stop racing for you know a mm -hmm. month or two, whatever. I go, I see the guy at the bike shop, Dave Eastwood. He realigns my cleat. I go back out. Two days later, the water's gone. There's no pain, and I'm right back on track. Yeah, I had a really fussy. Some people know, but other people... Your knees can get really fussy. When I first started cycling, I'd have pain in my patella tendon, which is that like big tendon right below your kneecap in mm -hmm. the front. And uh, I pushed my cleats back, yeah. instantly gone. Yeah, it helped uh, a yep. lot. Yep, and that That's was why my cleats are as far back as I can get them. Yeah, yeah. yeah but now I'm like in the middle, and I'm fine after many years of like strengthening. But uh, yeah. yeah. Anyways, uh, heal and then and then experiment. I'm not going to read this next name because I'm definitely going to be Bart Simpson on this one. Yeah. Um, but <laughs> says, hey, guys, can you comment on fat metabolization with uh, uh, with high intensity and upper threshold efforts? In other words, can you perform at 105 percent plus and expect to burn fat or do you only burn carbs at this point? Great question. Yeah. So different <laughs> levels of output. you uh, if you measure your gas exchange, you see, you know, if you're down at 0.7, you're supposedly burning primarily or maybe entirely fat. And then as you push up to an RER of 1.0, you're supposedly burning entirely carbohydrate, no fat metabolism whatsoever. Mm -hmm. um, there, it is slightly contentious because there is like a 1% or 2% margin up at the top of things that says you are still burning fat and that, and that the 1.0 is only because of something else that folds into the mix. I can't remember what it is, but it doesn't really matter. You're burning very little fat at that point. So mm -hmm. if you are at a 1.0 RER and you're not going to know this necessarily, unless you, you're not going to know it unless you do a gas exchange test, but 105... 105 is probably not going to put you there. Uh, I mm -hmm. can't say for sure. But that's <clears throat> that's not really your concern when you're doing high-intensity training, not in the moment. It's after the fact that any benefit in fat metabolism or fat uh, combustion mm -hmm. takes place. One thing that I see a lot of people thinking of, though, is like, okay, well, I just want to burn fat because I want to lose – I want to go for vanity composition, right, mm -hmm. like with their body. So then they just like do extremely low intensity. Oh man, intervals. And then you don't do enough of it. Are amazing at metabolizing fat. Yeah. Like I said, not necessarily in the moment, but after yeah. the fact. Yes, and that's just the thing. Like, uh, think of it this way: you can do a uh, you can do a ton of work that is very that isn't burning much fuel at all because it's just not intense. And sure, you may be primarily using fat in terms of fat versus carbohydrate, or you can do more work. And where you'll be doing, sure, in the moment you may be burning a ton of carbohydrate, but even then building up to it, you're going to be burning a lot of fat. And then afterward, it changes. In the 24 you. hours. So yep. there's so many studies that show that HIT workouts, high, in high intensity interval training, uh, improves body composition. Yep. Yes. More than just, like, just a slow steady distance for the same amount of time. Yep. Um, and you don't have to look very far to see evidence of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But then people look at this. This is this just grinds my gears. Yes. They go, what? But during the actual interval, like it's switched and I'm doing more carbs. So therefore, I'm not going to burn fat and I'm not going to do it. But if you look at the outcome when they do, they yeah. put Your people in groups. Yeah. Well, they over weeks, right? Yeah. And they do the two things. The group that does the high, high intensity interval training improves their body composition yep. more than the other group. Take a step back. Look at the longer term. Yep. Yep. Yeah, exactly. Uh, this one's from Christopher says, it sounds dumb, but I really don't understand how or when to fuel properly for a workout. I eat a few hours before to be topped up fuel during, and then some after in addition to norm or, and he says, is there anything in addition that I should be taking in? It's honestly like he's, he's hitting Great his question. marks, um, in, in, in some regards there, at least seemingly you're as versed on this as I am by now. Cool. Okay. So think of, this is for not keto athletes, right? This is for sure. We're talking Just about a regular yeah. carb, carb centric athlete. Um, your glycogen replenishment, think of this as like happening all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, don't think of like, oh, I'm just going to, I'm going to fit it all in right before my workout. So that's one right. thing, do that. But also I think um, 
for me and reading the research, like three to four hours before a workout is probably the best time to eat a meal. Mm -hmm. um, you can eat fiber and a little healthy meal. If you're in that one to two, some athletes, I'm like this, gets like hypoglycemic. Mm -hmm. And you can get like, you start working out and you get really shaky. Mm -hmm. And it's the worst feeling. Have you ever had that happen? Oh, 100%. Yeah. And yeah. it ruins your workout. What, to, yeah. what's, your, what's your ideal time? Uh, three to four hours. Yeah, three yeah, and a half. Even, even with that three to four hour window or three to four hours out, uh, high fat, high protein, Still yeah, yeah, I do a carb centric. Still meal. quite risky. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, you don't want to be taking in a ton of fat and a ton of no, protein. No, it doesn't. Yep. It, it won't digest that fast. I mean, you can give it a shot and you can see how it goes for you. Might not be a, 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 as big an issue for some people as it is for me. Yeah, but for me, it's pretty miserable. Yeah, it's individual, right? Yeah. So, so play with that Everything time. With nutrition is. Um, I've, those, I've yeah, and, and I just wanted as an anecdote, I found that two and a half I can get away with, but it's not ideal in every scenario. But two hours and forty five minutes to three hours is perfect. If I go beyond three hours, I feel like I'm. I'm deprived a bit when I okay. come in. Three hours is my sweet spot. Um, and then fuel during, uh, I think, unless you're going for some specific adaptions, um, you, uh, and we've talked about this before, uh, there's times to do that. Um, fuel during and then some after, yep, just, and I think we're, uh, I know Amber's really big on, uh, I point to the water bottle, that's where she sits, <laughs> um, big on the post-recovery shake. Yeah. Um, if, you're, if you're not doing multiple workouts a day, I'm not, uh, I don't think it's necessary. Just eat regular food. Regular food's got some great stuff in it. Yeah. Um, but if you're, I mean, she was very, very high out level athlete too, doing stuff. Yeah, uh, exactly. Let many, 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 many hours more than we are. Yep. Um, I think is that. Yeah, that, that covers it. it. Yeah. I think a lot of it too is like a perspective, like, and, and this may, you know, this is kind of venturing into different territory, but viewing the meals that you have is, is basically like an assistance to the workouts rather than just like it's lunchtime. So I just eat whatever I want at lunchtime. Like I know that for me, I, when I train in the afternoons, that's when I usually train, my lunch is very intentional. So like it also the comes down to how you, it. yeah, the timing and then the composition oh, of sure. it too, right? Sure. So I'm not going to go out and just eat a whole pizza or something before I go into mm -hmm. that. I need a bunch of cheese. Oh, am I? <laughs> Chad just, <laughs> I just realized I'm hungry. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The early morning workouts, I've actually changed it. I was doing like some kind of high carb meal directly ahead of time, like mm -hmm. 20 minutes. Now I'm doing... Um, I, uh, coffee. That's one benefit of working out early is I can't use caffeine at my 5 p.m. workouts. Yeah. But my 7 or 6 a.m. workouts, you mm -hmm. get caffeine. And man, <clears throat> caffeine Rip roaring. is amazing. Now that's, that's probably the best reason for doing workouts in the morning. But yeah. so what I'm doing now is like a gel, like 20 minutes ahead or 10 minutes ahead. Mm -hmm. And then immediately when I start the workout, I'm doing the like a 90 gram, 100 gram carb bottle. And then the uh, precision hydration. Uh, it's a low carb, high salt. I've been having great workouts with that. And I'm immediately, as I start the workout, sipping the both of those drinks. Mm -hmm. um, and that I've been doing 90 minute sweet spot or eating two hour sweet spot workouts in the yeah, morning. So make it clear you're talking about sweet spot workouts here. You're not yeah. just turning the legs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, these yeah. are these are like burners, right? Peak, mm -hmm. amazingly, right. like 1800 calories over two hours. And yeah. then I'm eating more after that. And I'm trying to get the 100 carbs an hour. Uh, and it's I've been having really good workouts on that. Yeah. Uh, this one comes from Aaron. He says on the subject of shifting around base plans, I'm going to be Nordic skiing on weekends. So I think I should shift the Saturday sweet spot base ride to a weekday, <clears throat> which weekday ride should I drop and replace with the Saturday ride? Uh, so in my mind, this would shift depending on, on how he's feeling with his training yeah. and <clears throat> what he, how he's responding to. He's it. trying to cram three or, or yeah, cram three quality workouts into five days. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be, it's going to take some trial and error. You're going to mm -hmm. find things that work for you and things that don't. What I don't want you to do is ditch either of the Tuesday or Thursday workouts, which means you're going to have to fill it. I mean, you could back those up, I guess, to a Monday, Tuesday sequence, take a day off and do a Thursday, move it to Thursday. Mm -hmm. It's going to take some rearranging, obviously. You still want to have your recovery days in there, and you don't want to go into probably your ski days flat, and you don't want to come out of that weekend flat. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be tricky to get three days of quality into five days. So I've I, I've had a, I have a similar With situation. With the ski weekend on the heels of that. Yep. Yeah. I have a similar situation to this and through a lot of trial and error, what I've found for me works is I fit the mid volume plan into Monday through Friday. That's pretty hard. That might be hard for some people, but, and then Saturday is open and Sunday is open. And for me, I take Sunday completely off and then Saturday I'll go for a ride. But then it's also like, I don't have, um, for me, like on the psychological side of things, like 
I then don't have to tell my family like, Hey, like, yeah. sorry, Saturday's here, but you know, you have to stay to the side. I have to do my training that way. I can just ride with them and spend the time with them and do active things. I, and I, it doesn't affect my training. Does your have... say it's unproductive? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it does. I actually. have had a number of clients who would come into the indoor classes, do a Saturday morning workout and then go out and ski. Yep. Oh. So there's no reason you can't pair those two things together, especially if you're 100%. a good skier and you're not going to maybe make it some epic day where you're out for eight hours. If you're mm-hmm. just going out for a couple hours, do your workout first, eat your breakfast, head out. Very I, possible. I, I did that before. last year. I would, uh, I started skiing last year and I would do a sweet spot workout yeah, Tuesdays. Sweet spot? Every time before. Totally. And your legs are tired, but you adapt. Nourish. Yeah. Make sure you nourish. Oh, yeah. Make sure you come into it loaded up. Make sure you eat during and make sure you eat after. That's then when goes, that recovery drink, drink is fun. handy. I'd have a Qdoba burrito, 1,000 calories. <laughs> that's right that's after. a heck of a oh, recovery drink right Well, there. I mean, I mean it's yeah, like a 1,500 yeah. calorie For sweet sure. spot workout, and yeah. that's also my lunch. Yeah. Uh, I was pretty yeah. hungry after skiing, too, because skiing is pretty depleting. Yeah. No joke. Yeah, yeah. For oh. sure. Yeah, 100%. That's a lot of work. I'm excited for it to start. Um, okay, <clears throat> uh, let's go into Justin's question. Uh, so he says, how should we think about Saturday weekend group rides replacing a training ride when we don't have a power meter to measure training stress and intensity factor? We have a way for you to be able to estimate if you do a ride and then you go in on your calendar on Trainer Road, it'll tell you like, hey, this ride doesn't have power data. Do you want to estimate it? And then we basically, you just, you you have us drop down to pick from and you can pick the intensity, uh, roughly the intensity of what it, what it was. And with time, you'll kind of figure out, figure it out. And you may even be able to figure out over time, like what the TSS value is. And you can just type it in too, if you want. Um, <clears throat> but the hard thing is I feel like on group rides, it's, um, most of the time you underestimate how much work you'll do coming in, but then on the backside of it, it's easy to overestimate how much work you did. Uh, so it's tricky. Uh, the one thing I would look at is if you can look at the actual time you spent working hard and kind of try to isolate that and focus on that, that's what I would try to quantify rather than if you did that, but then you had a 50 minute coffee stop after that. And then like 30 minutes of noodling and then 40 minutes of noodling before, you know what I mean? It just gets harder to, so I just focus on the work part and I set that that's the duration, that sort of thing. For me, how to adjust the training plan is I find like with our drop ride here, it's like mm-hmm. it's like let's say we're doing a fast group ride, that uh, compared to a threshold like over unders or um, low VO two max or maybe not low VO two max sweet spot work, uh, the indoor workout is a better workout than the group ride. Yep. But for VO two max, those group rides hmm. can put me to a level that I would not normally go to yeah. mm-hmm. or go to the same level. Um, the only problem is like the uh, the, the time between, yep. um, sometimes would, I would still get a better workout with indoors, yes. but if I'm going to switch it around, um, I would take my VO two max workout during the week and have that be replaced by the Saturday hard group ride mm-hmm. so that I get the threshold, um, at another day. Mm-hmm. Chad, what do you no, think? That sounds really good. Yeah. And it all depends on your, um, if your group ride is like 20 minute climbs at threshold, I mean, have that be your threshold day, right? Uh, yeah, it all depends. Yeah. All right, this uh, one says, what's the best way to connect cyclocross to spring classics? Uh, and mentions gravel grinders are primarily what they're going to be focusing on. It says, I'm, a prim- I'm primarily a cyclocross racer and usually have a lot of fitness at the end of the season. Um, so it sounds like I, I don't know what you do in the summer, and that is kind of like a key point yeah. uh, to bring in here. Um, let's probably, just Probably the first consideration, how much how – much- training load are you carrying into your cyclocross season is your cyclocross season you know like an eight week build into a four week Mm -hmm. racing commitment are you hitting it early and racing long so the duration of the actual cross season is going to influence i mean you say you come out with a lot of fitness so maybe you just exploit that fitness long enough to do a couple gravel grinders but if you want to plan a whole season of gravel grinders around it then i would just do what we typically recommend and take a like a two week or even a week long downturn and then head back into Geez, in that case, you might just jump straight across to another specialty plan. Depending on where you're at, yeah. The the one thing that I could, assuming that you did ride through the summer, because I assume you you probably did, I, I honestly wouldn't say it, say it was bad to jump into the halfway through base, go through the, ha- the second half of sweet spot base, mm-hmm. That's a great and place then to start ramp actually. through, <clears throat> because uh, that'll kind of like reset the deck, so to speak, in some ways. It's still hard. It's not easy. Um, it's hard work. But I think that it could be a really good thing uh, to be able to do that. Oh, and this is awesome. Uh, thanks, yeah. Tucker. I uh, just said that he says some mountain biking in the summer. So probably not like a lot of training stress, but at the same time, still not fully, you know, just doing nothing. So <clears throat> personally, so, uh, I would just ride that fitness wave until I got bored with racing gravel or I felt like I was starting to kind of come apart. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. So 
yeah, take some time uh, if you need to. Um, man, I don't know how Matthew Vanderpool is going to do it going into Tokyo this year, but he's back in the cross. I, I, it's almost like he just peppers in like one, you know, one to two week breaks. People look I, like newbies. I feel like this is some somebody posted this like we should not take. We should not do what he does because obviously 100%. he is oh, yeah. a different genetic beast. Like he is not yes. like a normal he's person. Not normal. He's unique. There's no There's nobody like him who does who just goes. Yeah, I'm gonna win everything all the time. <laughs> like I'm gonna do everything. Yeah. Not have any downtime. Roll into season to season. But I think you can kind of get like sucked into that, right? Because he's oh, the yeah. best, so I should do what the best does. Yes. Uh, to so just watch point. that, right? Like 100%. there's obviously something unique about him to be mm -hmm. able to do all of this amazingness. Yep, absolutely. Uh, Charlie says, I have nearly double the bone density for someone my age. That's uh, probably a good thing, a wow. good thing man. Um, it says, does skeletal mass actually add anything oh, yeah. appreciable to weight? Oh, yeah. yeah. You can get a DEXA scan and measure the bones. <clears throat> yeah. And I can, between them, I think I can, ooh, I want to say I can gain like two pounds with skeletal muscle or skeletal density, yep. depending on like. Uh, Over what span of time? Like a year. Really? I think uh, I got to look again, but you can yeah. get a uh, Keegan Swenson just did yeah. this yeah. Um, and he had low bone density and he tried to raise it. Do you remember how yeah, much he raised I it? I can't remember the exact percentage. You should head over to, um, and we can post this in the forum, the Instagram post that he made, but uh, search for Keegan Swenson on Instagram. You'll be able to find him because he posted about it, but he, um, his bone density was low <clears throat> and then he incorporated strength training and proper diet, plenty of other things. And now his bone density is in the normal range. Yeah. I might have been, it might have been 200 or 400 grams, so like more like half a pound or pound, but mm -hmm. I'm, it is definitely enough where it's measurable. It's measurable. Yeah. yeah it's not like 10 grams. We, yeah. were, we were talking about like pro tour riders and we, were, we want to see their DEXA scans to Nibbly. see if like maybe it doesn't even pick up needle <laughs> bones. <laughs> right? like he, <laughs> he's who broke his hip like going five miles per hour, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, man. So, I mean, road riders, they have bird bones. They it might, you might, I mean, seriously, too, that's another way to lose weight is just have <laughs> less dense bones. I mean, it is. <laughs> not but, smart. Maybe not yeah. one I'd advocate, but yeah. No, yeah. no. I mean, if you're trying to win the Tour de France, is a lot different than all of us. Sure. All of us, they we might, should be. They might intentionally be like seeking to drop their bone density. Well, it's, it's just going to happen right? naturally because the amount that they I train, know. The But they'll low... be excited when they see it, which is the crazy yeah. thing, you know? Yeah. yeah. Oh, crazy age up. groupers let's not let's have these let's muscles and strong bones and live forever just nobody, exactly right nobody do that let's just go into a couple more questions and then we'll be done here for the week uh next one is uh from sitka says would you still try to avoid protein and fats for a pre-ride breakfast if you're doing something like a mountain bike stage race like bc bike race with big back-to-back -back days yeah, like a hundred percent. And I see this a lot of the time at races where they're like, yeah, we got bacon, we got eggs. Yeah, you can we get got that all. stuff later. And it's like yeah. at a different time. Yes. Yeah, and afterwards, especially, afterwards would be fantastic. Especially over multiple yes. days. Like you got to get those glycogen stores stopped up and there's a limit to how much your stomach can take. Yep. Um, which when you're eating eggs and bacon, uh, it really like fills you up. And yeah. the other side of it too, is when you're doing a stage race and you get GI distress because of that. That GI distress is going to affect the day, which then affects your recovery, which then it may even carry into the next day. And then it throws everything off, you know? Yeah. So it's, yeah, like nutrition, like everything is more important with stage racing. But I feel like if you don't have nutrition dialed for a stage race, like triathletes have full distance Ironman. If you, like you can, you can squeak through an Olympic with bad nutrition and you can kind of get through, but you cannot do it with a full distance race. And with stage racing for cyclists, it's the same thing. Silver you can days. squeak through for a single day, but you cannot hide it. If you go yeah. through multiple days, I'm going to do, even though I threw it up before, <laughs> I, I'm going to do cream of wheat, but the mm. wheat for Nair for Farina, I forget what it's called, but the, the kind without, we got multiple meal and had a whole bunch of other stuff in it that I don't want. And I think that's made me throw up, but I'm going to have that every morning because it has low fiber mm. and yeah. it's just pretty much pure carbs, Tastes a little bit of too. almond milk because yeah. um, of the dairy issues that I have yeah. and just try to pack in like 150 grams of it three hours before yeah. the race starts um, and then try to fuel the whole time, fuel afterwards. And after the race, I will have more protein and fat, like Chad said, with regular meals. And then before bed, I'm going to do a very high probably the same either oat, probably oatmeal at night just as yeah. much as i can take in to pack it in because over that eight days of cape epic i guarantee you i will not replenish my oh, glycogen I, no and i guarantee you i'm going to lose body fat like i'm yep. not going to physically be able to unless i just do all popeyes which i don't think they have it in south africa <laughs> uh, but if they did if they did <laughs> <laughs> just kidding i would not do that um but as i go uh I'm going to lose body fat and I'm going to, uh, lose glycogen during eight days, riding six hours a day. Like 
there's just not enough hours in the day. Team Nate fueled by Popeye's, just like pulling out drumsticks out of his jersey. We still pocket. haven't. Hey, the sandwich is back, and we haven't tried it yet. We haven't tried it. Speaking of which, Chad said he was never going to eat fried food, yeah. and I've asked all the employees to yeah. take a picture of him if he does. No one's taking a picture because nobody's caught me doing it. Even, <laughs> no one's I, caught I had, you. I had, <laughs> okay, I haven't done it. No, there's been, been nothing to catch. There was some uh, deep fried shrimp on my menu in recent days, and I pulled off the breading. Huh? Look at that. Diligent. Ever diligent, Chad. Just a couple of last ones. Is BMI index good reference for optimal cycling weight? I would say no. No. Um, not at all. And then the last one, any recommendations on affordable skin suits? Uh, not a specific one, but however, there are tons of closeout ones. And like skin suits are really hard for shops or online retailers to stock because it's, you know, it's like a for take the, the pie of cyclists that are going to buy expensive kit that's one thing then take the ones that are going to buy an expensive skin or like a nice skin suit that's even smaller so they don't usually stock a whole lot of them or they have overstock so i'm thinking of like backcountry.com that sort of stuff or competitive cyclists same company there those ones if you look online you can find a lot of um uh uh Ones that they're going to be closing out. I got about a thousand used ones we can put up for auction. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, thank you. Don't buy a used um, skin Steve suit. M. Yeah. Well, I can never say Steve's listening. Mikowski. Mikowski. Um, he did buy an affordable skin suit and he put it in the forum. Uh, oh, cool. I don't know if Chad, if someone can find it and put it in the, the thread for this, but cool. I remember I seen a picture of it and uh, yeah, it was, I mean, it was tight. Who knows how it performs, but it looked good. And I think he, I'm not sure. I can't speak any more to that. But if you have any more info, please put it in the forum thread for this. What I episode is this? 230. Uh, 232. 232. Cool. I'm going to remove some names on this one, but just share kind of an interesting skin suit thing that I heard the other day. Mm. But uh, so uh, this this name I won't remove, but uh, Quinn Simmons, incredible cyclist, right? Uh, he's like he's a, pretty good. Yeah, he's, he's fine. Yeah. A generational cyclist coming up. Uh, lost. I can't remember what he lost the world's TT by. Was it 20 seconds? Something Wasn't around much. there. Yeah. Uh, Somebody was saying that in testing of the different skin suits that they have, that the current skin suit that they had uh, cost him more time than he would have lost versus what they were using before, hmm. uh, which is interesting. So like uh, the other side of it, if you're looking for an affordable skin suit, we've talked about this before, even like with the guys that specialized, just because it's a skin suit does not mean that it's going to be faster than a yeah. tight fitting good kit, right? A separate bib and jersey combo even. And maybe how tight it is. Yeah. And, and they say... One thing that Super Dave, uh, Super Dave Kazel told us, if there's a wrinkle, it's slower than skin. So like he said, like if you have a long sleeve skin suit, the reason you don't see a lot of them is because you just can't get them on without wrinkles for a lot of people. So if there's a wrinkle on that forearm, it's probably slower than if you just had skin on there. So it's, uh, if when you get that skin suit, that's a really important thing to keep in mind that they're not all created equal. They can save you time, but they can also cost you time. So, yeah. It, uh, the equipment thing, Andy Potts, he probably lost a world championship in Ironman because he ran gator skins at Kona. <laughs> it's like the famous story. Yeah. yeah, right? Yeah. And this other guy I know, he lost uh, Nationals podium by like 0.5 seconds. Yeah, I wonder who that was. And he didn't have a wax chain. He didn't have like tight stuff. I don't know who you're talking about. I was looking at Quinn Simmons. <laughs> <laughs> this it's is Chad uh, Timmerman. He lost by less than 20 seconds. It's 19.94. So, yeah, I can understand. Yeah. How much did you miss podium at who? TT National Flight? <laughs> what was the amount of time? It's like 0. 0.6 seconds or something like 0. that. 0. 0.6 seconds. Do you think about that at the end of every race? Not really, because it was for a fifth place. It was like just just creeping onto the or squeaking onto the podium. How it much was third away? Oh, I don't know. I don't Four know. minutes. I don't remember. <laughs> no, hopefully not. <laughs> Just yeah. kidding. No, I, I mean, fifth place at nationals is... Legit. Legit, Chad. And especially <laughs> Masters TT Nets. That's like a... There's like some things like you could go to like... Uh, I don't know. You could go to like track Nats and, and sometimes it's like two people. We don't want to... Yeah, talking... Yeah. Right? How but about uh, Cyclocross Mas Cat 5? <laughs> sure, <laughs> districts. Exactly. <laughs> there's exactly. three people. <laughs> but when you talk about like Masters TT Nets, that's legit. That's yeah, no, like it was, a really It was a legit field too. Yeah. So I... Imagine if you would have got because you're legit, Chad. Well, if he would have got fifth, well, he, he got six. <laughs> He's still a legend. I'm just a, <laughs> never was. Because, <laughs> almost <seconds>. was. <laughs> Not even a has been. Yeah, oh, almost man. was. That's aggressive. Um, okay. Sorry. Thanks Maybe your so, iron was low. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> He's already getting just, in his head for the iron. Man I know, right? <laughs> <clears throat> All right. Thanks for joining us, everybody. And remember, you can do so every Thursday at 8 a.m. Pacific on YouTube or if you're listening to this on whatever podcast you have. Honestly, one of the best ways to help us because we don't 
uh, plenty of people ask to sponsor this podcast all the time. We say no. Um, plenty of people like ask to you know monetize it in some way, and we don't do it. And we want to keep it free for you guys, and we do that because we want to make you faster. If you share this podcast, that's honestly the biggest thing that can help. Yeah, with that said, though. If subscribers want to send me beer, that's <laughs> okay. You'll or that it. Primal Meat Company want to like <laughs> chat wear a Primal Meat shirt every time and a hat. Yeah, they have the beer. Beaten steak right in the middle. Yeah. This is delicious. They have a sign flipper up like here in the middle. Double and triple IP. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. trainer up to say Primal. <laughs> <laughs> Imperial Stouts, Imperial Porters. Yeah. So, but if you share the podcast, honestly, it's hugely helpful for us. Uh, or sign up for Trainer Road. Yeah. Shout out to the yes, of course. Uh, sign up share for Trainer Road. Road. It will make you faster. Share it. Shout out to all the meme lords, the cycling meme lords out there. Because we've been involved in quite a few memes recently, and uh, we appreciate that. <laughs> we it's share good them to the whole company. They are they're hilarious, funny. pretty funny. So, uh, and thank you, everybody. We'll talk to you all next week. Thanks, everybody. Bye, bye.